Hello and welcome back to the Nexus Gaming Series. I am the Crushinator and I return with Mockery today. How you doing, Mockery? Hello, I'm doing well. You know, uh, I was excited to get a bit of a warm up with you yesterday with those Div E East playoffs that we got to cast last night. And full respect to those guys, but what I'm really looking forward to here are these matches tonight mm -hmm. with these Storm Div Finals. A bit of a step up in intensity, in stakes, and I just, I personally know a lot of players that we're about to see here tonight, so this is going to be fun. I, I know a bit about the, the history with these players, and I can tell you that it's going to be exciting. I've got some really good talent right here. I am excited. How you doing, bud? I'm doing great. I've got a new processor today. I got super, super lucky sniping the new Ryzen 5800 3D. Um, I can't believe I got it, but we've got a webcam for Mockery today. Everything's looking real crisp, so I'm hoping that the quality is chef's kiss today. Um, we've got We Take It The Wayeth versus Pre-Workout Power. This is the grand finals here. This is all it's going to be. It's not going to be a double knockout where someone's got to win two series. We Take It The Wayeth coming in as the first seed, as first pick and map pick for the first map. But otherwise, it's just a straight up best of five. Yeah, and I was talking with you a little bit uh, off camera before we got started here. And I gotta say, I think that's an elegant solution for the team that's ahead to not get a full just match win, game win right off the start going into the series 1-0, uh, mm -hmm. but instead just giving them the advantage of dictating both map and pick. That really gives you the opportunity to just have a ton of control over the strats that you're going to run when those games get started. Okay. and really just set the tone for the entire series. So here with We Taketh Awayeth, you know that whatever they're running right here, this is something that they they had an idea of it, they had a game plan, and I wanna see them put it into action right here. I wanna see what they do when they come in with the advantage. We're trying to fill up our lobby. Looks like our last player is pending invite. Once that is settled, We'll hopefully be able to get into our game number one. Well, we've got an opportunity. Let's go over to the map pick screen, see what has been banned away. Dragonshire and Volskaya Foundry removed here by We Taketh Awayeth. Pre-workout power has banned Braxis Holdout and Alterac Pass. And we're going to kick things off on Battlefield of Eternity for game number one. Battlefield of Eternity <laughs> is a map that when I think of it, I just think of open-endedness. You can run for poke, you can go for full double support, five on five team fight. You can even pressure the map a decent bit. A lot of people don't really play for that style, but you totally can. And a lot of that is born out of not as huge of a need for wave clear being present on Battlefield as is the case on almost any other map in the game. Absolutely. Battlefield is a map. Yeah, Battlefield is a map where you see Leeming, Genji, you see Leeming, Tracer, just Situations where if you tried to run that on, say, Cursed or even some other two-lane maps, uh, you just wouldn't have enough macro. But when you're spending so much time in the middle of the map, uh, you you know, just away from these minions, you can really run some special comps. So that's what I want to see. As much as I was talking about uh, here with We Take It The Way, if I, I want to see what they do when they've got a very just wide open situation. This is their map. This is their pick on the map that allows you to play basically whatever you want. What do they have in store for us? Don't have to wait too much longer. The R's are starting to come out. We'll be able to get going here. Battlefield of Eternity. We've seen these teams against other teams in the division. They've definitely played around with the drafts a little bit. More we take it away than pre-workout powers so far this season. But this is like, this is, there's going to be a lot of internal meta here. These team players play with each other quite a bit, play against each other quite a bit. So the drafts are going to be extra next level here. And looks like the readies are in. We'll be able to get started. Just someone's got to hit the button. Get going. Just waiting on our host right here. And I will say, just talking about the level of internal meta that we can expect to see here tonight, I will say these are players that I have been familiar with since all the way back in the HGC era, which we know got canceled in late 2018. So... There, there are just years of history for us to pull mm -hmm. from uh, in order to see what the capabilities of these players are, uh, to, to note their history. It's 
it's going to be good to see what players like unaverted for example unaverted i look at him and i look at legacy i look at these players and i'm like these are guys that were in the hgc open scene nasmus was in hgc itself uh, we've got we've got the talent we've got the history and then they they've proven they've still got it here going into the finals i am ready to see how it culminates going into these finals as we see lunara the first ban of the series Nara has been pretty heavily contested in Storm Division through the weeks. The vision that Lunara gives is just so powerful against teams that can coordinate ganks really, really well. That's something that you're going to see at the highest level. There's not any... When the call is made, all five are always going in. So if you get that extra vision, it can really, really help out. Junkrat, of course, still an ultra-powerful hero through warding, damage, and just ultimately safety. Oh yeah, the ability to have a character that just controls vision, especially on Battlefield. Battlefield is a map where you're playing out in the dark for a lot of it, mm -hmm. okay? And that's, uh, I think, also an aspect of the Lunara band that we saw right there with her ability to influence the vision through her Sentinel Wisp. Junkrat does a lot of the same thing. Junkrat punishes your lack of vision. If you ever, anybody who's ever uh, face-checked right onto a trap knows exactly what I'm mm -hmm. talking about. So I perfectly understand why they want to get rid of it. And the game is always better when Hogger is out. And there we see a Lucio first pick by Weary Day. Lucio has really moved up the priority list since the last patch, being one of our best cleansing heroes, and also being a hero that can get away with a lot on the battlefield. We take it away. I'm happy to snap that up first, as we saw the big Blaze Hogger bands hit the board. We'll see what pre-workout power has to respond with. If they have something for this Lucio. They're gonna go with a new Barak Li Ming, a pretty uh, pretty classic combo here for Battlefield. Yeah, Li Ming used to be uh, used to have a decent bit of counterplay into a new Barak back in the olden days of Heroes of the Storm, pre-2019, uh, when you used to be able to blink to dodge the cocoon. That mm. is of course no longer possible as of a patch in late 2019. And so, with all the beetles in your way, with Anubarak spell armor, it can be a bit of a rough matchup for sometimes. So I like pairing the Anubarak with the Li Ming. Li Ming, of course, having strong race, strong poke onto the Immortal, and taking away the Anubarak, preventing the counter from also appearing at the same time. Meanwhile, on the other hand, on the side of We Take It The Way, if we see Dahaka and Greymane picked up right there. Dahaka, one of the best offlaners, and of course, Greymane, just the turbo high race, one of the fastest Immortal racers in the entire game. Absolutely. Greymane going to be able to work on solo clearing the Immortal while the rest of the team defends, if that is the setup that we take at the way it wants to go with here. We see Diablo and Stukov band away here. Stukov, definitely a good pairing with Anubarak, who keeps people still for quite a while. And Li Ming, I'm sure, is happy not to see a Diablo bear down on the other side of the battlefield. Yeah, Soul Shield is always just going to be a problem talent for any mage. It basically makes their mages just irrelevant to you for the for a handful of seconds, especially after Diablo's fairly recent changes, uh, limiting the amount of souls that you lose when you. I know they've pulled it out a few times here and there, and I am excited to see it here again. Not exactly what I expected, to be honest. And of course, Legacy on that Regar. Legacy, a strong support player with years of history of success. I was just talking to him on Twitter the other day. He believes his comms are what separates him as a player. His ability to communicate with his team, share that information, uh, make calls, even call off calls that he think uh, that he thinks will not work out. Uh, you love to see just veterans of the game right here. Meanwhile, on the other hand, uh, we have Muradin and Hanzo getting picked up. So I'm just looking at this. And I'm thinking, man, this is so much race. They yeah. just shred through that immortal on the side of We Take It Away with the combination of that serrated arrows Hanzo and the gray main. It's looking like We Take It Away may not necessarily be going for big brawls here. They've got a lot of people who can go back and burn that immortal. They've got decent side clear and Hanzo and Dahaka. Greymane can help out there as well. Pre workout power. I like the Genji response to go and harass those side lanes. Samuro is going to be a little bit of a wild card here. I don't know. Pre workout power. I feel like they've got some really nice kill potential if they can catch We Take It Away without. Well, yeah, of course. Whenever you look at a composition that has. Uh, Li Ming and Genji at the same time, there's one word that should immediately come to mind, and that's resets, okay? 
We have Li Ming getting resets on all her abilities whenever she gets a takedown, and of course Genji with that blade dash getting it reset after a target that has been recently hit by it uh, getting killed. So, this is a composition with a very clear ideology. They want to poke at the immortal with the Li Ming, and whenever they can find somebody that's a little bit isolated, a little bit caught out, you simply just go all in on them, you utilize that synergy, blow up that one target, get your Li Ming and Genji resets, and convert that into getting more and more kills. You can really just blow everything on one guy and trust resets to clean up the rest of it. And I just really quick want to point out before we get started, that's a Legion of Beetles on this Anubarak right here. You'll love to oh, see yeah. it. yeah. The Beetle build is in. Let's introduce our teams here. For game number one on the left in the blue, we have We Taketh Awayeth. Zergling is on the Hanzo. Tremor is playing Muradin. Weary Day is on the Lucio. Mason Blaze is playing Greymane. And Slug Hunter is on the Dahaka. On the right side here, for the side of pre-workout power, we have CPX uh, playing this game as Storm Pog X on the Genji, Maka bringing it to us on the Ming, Unaverted on Anubarak, Legacy on Regar, and Nazmus playing that Samuro. Let's see it happen. Samuro up in the top lane there, waiting on Dahaka. See CPX lurking on the top side, but Tremor controlled that vision there. Lucio gonna be able to put in some pretty consistent damage, but look at the engage oh, wow. in the mid. Hanzo immediately popped there. Maka and Unaverted really locking in for that first kill. That burst damage is just no joke. You can already see exactly what we're talking about here. Unaverted and CPX trying to go in on Weary Day, but Lucio is a rather slippery little guy. Mason Blaze taking big damage from the Arcane Missiles, the Magic Missiles. Arcane is the orb. Asmus <laughs> and Slug Hunter trading a few hits here in this top lane, but still just that instant kill pressure. I think that's one of those early game ints where you, you're like, oh yeah, I'm against a burst comp. I gotta, I gotta take it easy here. <laughs> I gotta show him a little respect. See if that respect is given as we see Weary Day chasing out Unaverted on the low side, just keeping an eye on things. Lucio, that mobile ward in a way, going to be very helpful for We Taketh Awayeth here. As the uh, we pre-workout power really just waiting on an opportunity to move in. Ooh, unaverted, wow, already evening this up one for one. Two kills in the first minute and a half here but that kill going to be significantly in favor uh, with the timing towards We Take It The Way of allowing them to capitalize with an early siege camp. CPX also taking some damage in the meantime, able to blade dash right on out of there. Nicely done, and nicely now done. We see the rotation from We Take It The Way of towards that top side. They know they've already gotten what there is to have in this bottom lane. They've secured that siege camp, so now they want to see if they can do the same thing in that top lane. They would love to go for this camp right now, because that'll give them just enough time to still squeeze out this bruiser camp, and then they will have taken three out of the four maps before this first objective. See, Nazma's gonna stick ahead in here. Genji, not gonna come on up. Rhaegar was thinking about moving on in, but Samuro, definitely not one to just go and fight on the point versus multiple heroes. We take it the way it is controlling the map right now. Pre-workout power starting their right side shaman camp. We take it the way of doing the same thing on the left getting all the chores done before we head into our first immortal spawn. Yeah, and that's a fairly standard opening so far for Battlefield of Eternity. And Battlefield, as long as nothing particularly wild happens, generally looks the same in the early game each time. The team that gets an early game advantage takes the siege camp and then pressures the other siege camp, and you're always going to try and get these bruisers ahead of first objective if possible. Now teams looking to clear each other's camps, those top siege getting cleared out by pre-workout power. No significant XP advantages either way as we go into our first objective. Mason Blaze right into the race here for We Taketh Awayeth, and I'm really interested to see what these teams' plans are, not just for this immortal phase, but for the later ones in terms of how much delay they want to do here. Mason Blaze being driven out, unaverted, was going for a stun, but comes up a little bit short. Weary Day pushes off on through, and now, oh, Tremor's actually stunned, trying to jump after unaverted, pushed away by the objective, and now is forced to move on out. Can they find tr kill onto Tremor? A mirror image blocked there, and Muradin is going to get away. For a second, it looks like the jump just completed normally, with, a, with the Immortal knocking Tremor in the same direction as his jump. Both teams still just racing it out at this point. And this is where I really expect to see the power of Greyman and Hanzo start to kick in. Zergling actually forced to tap rather than race. Very minor advantage for pre-workout power in this race out, and this might look like it's going to be a little close. 
Query Day and Tremor on the right-hand side trying to delay here. Hanzo has the level 4 scatter, so we'll be able to help it's out in of the, the clear. Wire. Oh, wow. 1.5k is the only difference when we take it away if are going to get this first objective. Rework out power. Going to continue to poke in for a moment. Tremor just going to absorb those shots and heal right back up again like a good Dwarf King can. Yeah, and before Genji gets that Shingon at level 13, I expect to see him get outraced by the Grey Mane, by the Hanzo that we see on the opposing side. And you can really see just the full investment into the race kicking in on the side of We Take It Away at the moment. And not only do these heroes have excellent Immortal Race, but of course by virtue of the same aspects of their kit, they also have excellent Siege. As we see them pressuring onto this first fort, I don't think they're going to be able to finish it in its entirety. Yeah, they're only going to get so much damage on it here as this Immortal mm -hmm. gets shredded, but that is a great way to start this game. They're going to stick around for just a moment. They've got to be a little bit careful running away from an Anubarak Genji but it looks like they're doing a good job of keeping their distance, and now that their minion wave is starting to dwindle, to move on back to safety here. Or maybe not, as PX point... is going to jump in look for Tremor. <laughs> Verdin getting caught a little bit of Nubarak. Oh, Avon Averted nearly finding the stun there. A Zergling going to follow up and put a little bit of damage in, and Weary Day is just going to go and be that annoying little Lucio interrupting the rotation. And while all this is going on, we see Mason Blaze over there actually getting started on the siege camp, getting one of those Cosbra down, but deciding against sticking around as they saw the rotation coming in from pre-workout power, electing to back off, and now the second siege camp of the game, second bot siege camp of the game, going over to the side of pre-workout power, evening up that pressure in total in the bot lane. Zergling, however, trying to get that top side aided by Slug Hunter. However, we do see some rotations on the way. They've got to finish this up soon, and they will get it in time. Just barely in time there. They felt the pressure barreling on down. Weary Day doing, once again doing a great job on Lucio of just making sure that everyone has to move dismounted. Because I think if they were mounted up, they might have got there in time. But it is going to be a trade on these camps. Both teams approaching level 9 about the same time here. We'll see if there's enough of a delay to find level 10 or if we're going to have another quick Immortal phase. At this point, neither team looks significantly advantaged over the other. It's actually remarkably even at this point. Tahaka getting some soak in that top lane. Both teams forming up. Bruiser teams coming up, or Bruiser camps coming up at just slightly an awkward timing. Coming up just about now for both teams, but they want to pressure these Immortals. You see a little bit of posturing in mid lane tremor forced to jump on out of there quickly followed by cpx who takes a bit of damage a timely deflect gonna save them from something but still chunked by mason legacy. blaze legacy actually dropping he's gonna be okay legacy got a big hit there but is able to use those bodies to move on back as the teams are trying to get to their side lane soak out level 10 there's slug hunter on the top side there's the rest of pre-workout power just gonna quickly knock out that lane and we'll see who grabs their 10s first, but both teams absolutely waiting for that spike. Both teams just love to get so much extra kill pressure once you get to that 10. Oh, Maka's in trouble on the, the top side. Wow, Li Ming chased wow. down there, Weary Day finding one. And you'd think that Genji would be the one out there fighting people on the pick, <laughs> but Lucio has been the master assassin so far. Well, I don't see a Tychus anywhere, so I'm not sure what you're talking about as far as a Master Assassin goes. But, you know, Lucio uh, gets called Heal Tracer pretty often, and you can see it right there, able to just hound the Li Ming all up in their face. CPX with the Agile Dismount onto the backline immediately thinks better of it and oh, gets out. That's arrow. a huge arrow from Zergling, and the follow-up takes out CPX. There's the Cocoon and the Burrow Charge out, and that's only going to be a single kill, but a big one in favor of We Take It The Way. Great arrow there from Zergling, catching all three. All Mason Blaze had to do was get in there and bark one down. Genji gonna have to come on back with the respawn. But look at the clear. We take it the way that they tap their back camp as well. So they're gonna get an objective pushing the bottom lane as well as their shaman camp here. Samuro's actually hit with the drag there by Slug Hunter, but by virtue of being a Samuro, is just gonna walk away. Ubrak may not yeah, there was a here. bug actually in the earlier states of HOTS, and I know what you're thinking, a bug with Samuro? No way. Uh, but there was a bug <laughs> in earlier versions of Heroes of the Storm where Samuro could actually occasionally die, believe it or not. Uh, but awesome. I believe that has since been long patched out of the game. As we see pre-workout power 
Defending against their second Immortal of the game nine minutes in, this one's significantly more threatening onto that bottom fort, unaverted taking decent damage in the meantime. Sidewalls trying to get taken out by Zerglings so they can get some better scatter angles. Mm -hmm. Unaverted getting knocked away and this fort looks like it's gonna go down. There There's is the, the cocoon, cocoon onto Lucio. Lucio gets caught, but Slug Hunter coming in from the side. Nasmus is coming on down, and we've got a full engage here. Unaverted gonna get hit with that ancestral healing to stay alive. Weary Day forced out. Li Ming is gonna get hit there, though, by Greymane. Looking for a reset. There's the bark again. Anubarak is gonna go down. Tremor's so low, but does survive here. CPX trying to get a deflect with so many little instances of damage with that Dark Swarm. Tremor starting to heal up here, but that's a double kill for We Taketh Awayeth on the remnants of that fort. They get the first structure, and now they're starting to pull ahead in these kills. Yeah, it was definitely even to start out the game, but we see, at this point, We Taketh Awayeth consistently getting these victories. They won the first two objectives, they took the first two camps, and I gotta say, as much as it has been a team effort, Zergling is hitting these arrows. Oh, yeah. And I tell people... I tell people all the time, you know, I say, hey, if I could choose between a Hanzo that knows all these fancy little tricks and that can do this and that, or a Hanzo that hits his arrows, I'm taking the Hanzo <laughs> that hits his arrows. And I think Zergling is a good player that can do both, all right? Um, I had the good fortune to be able to play with him for a brief moment in time on site esports. Uh, where I was heavily outclassed by everyone else on the roster. We see some Look we see that. some pressure. And now both forts already advantaged in favor of We Taketh Away 13 advantage. They feel pretty safe going for this siege camp. 13 now achieved as well for pre-workout power. We may see a bit of a scuffle, but with the camp taken, they're just gonna go ahead and try and back out of here. There's a cocoon onto Weary Day. Weary Day able to get behind the wall there before the cocoon hits, so that's gonna cause a problem here. So Taka is coming in for the flank, unaverted. Nowhere to go is gonna get caught. Another arrow is gonna hit onto Li Ming. Maka gonna try to blink out, but Rhaegar is chased down. Li Ming is next to fall. CPX and Nasmus, the only ones left here. Genji is gonna be dragged and removed. Quad kill for We Take It the Way at the right on top of this objective spawning. Nasmus is being chased down. Weary Day wants the last hit. There are the mirror images, but they had so little health that Samuro is quickly revealed to bring the full ace for We Take It the Way at. And now they're going to get what's very likely to be a close to full shield immortal. And at this point, you got to start feeling a little bit of desperation from pre-workout power. At this point, once you start losing those early keeps, as is liable to happen with a very strong immortal soon to be just around the corner, at that point, you got to start thinking about getting some burst picks. You got to think, what can we do to make a play to get ourselves back into this game? Luckily, they're playing the perfect comp to get a burst pick. Zergling actually getting engaged on by Unaverted does get the timely high five from Weary Day, booping away CPX. Oh, oh actually, goes CPX down. goes down the before ancestral. the ancestral healing connects. Ancestral almost hit, and now it's a total turnaround. It's 16 versus 13, and we take it the way if find the turnaround triple. Nice dodge on the arrow there, but Mach is still gonna get hit with the drag, and Li Ming is popped. Look at We Take It The Way If They've got pressure in the top lane, the bottom lane is pushed in. They are 100% in control here, even going for a Bruiser Camp steal. Not even a single point of damage onto the Immortal for We Take It The Way If, and I gotta say, Crush, I, I appreciate you being nice and calling it a dodge, but let's say it like it is. That was a bit of a miss on the dragon arrow. Not to take away from We Take It The Way of Wonderful stuff so far. Bit of fighting, a little bit of a scuffle, unaverted on the scene at the moment. And like I said, they're getting oh, desperate. Drag. They want to find something. Love the tongue from Slug Hunter. Wow. wow. Slug Hunter just biding their time there. Finds the Anubarak trying to go out and follow up the engage from Samuro and Genji, but no luck to be had. A noob down for 24 seconds means that, oh goodness, Samuro caught again. The burst is insane. It's just one drag and that is it. X-Strike is gonna try to get CPX on out of there, but Genji is gonna fall. We take it away if they're gonna push towards the core. I mean, you have every reason to with your Immortal at 75% overall HP, three members of pre-workout power dead. What is this arrow going <laughs> off deep into the Northwest BM, maybe clicking on the map? Who knows? Regardless, it's still a victory for We Take It The Way of in dominating fashion. Like I said, wow. they came into this series, they had the advantage. They had both the map pick and the first pick, so they came into this with the ability to play what they wanted, and they came to play. 17 kills to one, 13 minute game. That's more than a kill per minute. Oh, Just yeah. absolutely setting the tone. I 
I hope that we don't see such a beatdown in game. Well, I'll tell you what. As I drop some frames, I think I'm on the way back here. In game two, let's let's change it up a little bit. Am I back? All right, I think I'm back. Looking at no the... Uh, <laughs> I'm still coming in and out. I'm taking a look. I'm very unhappy with my upload, but we will work on that later. At least the frames are crispy today. It's looking fantastic. But yeah, I mean, Battlefield of Eternity, We Take It Awayeth, looking super, super clean out there. We'll see if pre-workout power can bring it back. They've absolutely brought it back as the season's gone on. I mean, they're here in the grand finals. They've had some really great series here versus We Take It Awayeth so far. So I'm not worried in that it's going to be just a total stomp all the way. Unless we take it away, if there's going to, you know, bust out something that pre-workout power is not seeing coming. You know, and that's the thing about HOTS is, as much as a series can look absolutely one-sided in game one, that doesn't always say how games two, three, four, and potentially five are going to go in this best of five right here. Uh, as, as much as things can go that way, I just want to see a little bit of shaking up the comps. Say, okay, mm -hmm. hey, that didn't work out for us game one, but you know what? We take it to a different map, we run a, a slightly different style of play, and it's a whole different game. And remember, in game two, We Take It The Way is not going to have the simultaneous advantage of both map pick and first pick. They will only have one of the two. Um, I believe the structure is now that pre-workout power gets to choose which of the two they would like. Yes, so we fairly, do have our next lobby stuff. up here. Pre-workout power, losing game number one. They choose between first pick and map pick. We do have our next lobby up, and it looks like pre-workout power opting for the first pick over on Tomb of the Spider Queen. We take it the way of taking us to Tomb of the Spider Queen right here. This is a map you absolutely love to see, and I gotta say, I expect to see more priority onto a lot of the same heroes that we saw before. I expect to see the Hogger, the Junkrat, two heroes that were banned in game one. I would be very surprised if when we take it to such a wave clear centric map to not see them represented mm -hmm. or at least uh, considerably threatened here in game two. Absolutely. And we've got, you know, we'll see if there's any changes up in, uh, I mean, Tomb, there's a couple of other picks that you got to worry about as well. We might end up seeing the Blaze and the Hogger if they feel like they need to take out more assassins. We've seen some, a lot of tank control here on Tomb, and we've even sometimes seen some Mephisto bans right off the bat. So it's going to be coming down to what these teams want to control here, because they've only got the two bans at the start. They've only got the two bans at the start, and there are just so many different heroes to prioritize, just in terms of blanket overall power level, and that's before you even get into what the players specifically are good at. These are players that mm -hmm. have deep pools, that have played the games for long, long times, long histories, and you can only take out so many heroes, exactly like you said. I honestly wonder, Crush, how would you feel about a fourth ban coming in right after that third ban? Or maybe even before the, the last round of picks, you know, just, just something. How would you feel about that? You know, I've talked to a few different people about, you know, what, what we can do as a community to patch the game in a way. Like, what do we have control over? We have control over maps. We have control over some talent choices. But I think the main, honestly, the main toggle we have control of as a community is the bands. We can do it separately in these custom lobbies. Whether it's having extra mid bands, whether you get three bands at the top instead of two, I think it would be a cool toggle to play with if, uh, if maybe, you know, a tournament would give it a try or some in-houses would give it a try. It's tough when you don't have, you know, everybody on board and you have to go back to just what the game has in store. But I think it would be cool to see how the meta would shift if both teams just got a couple extra bans. Yeah, and, and I just want to walk our viewers through a very brief history of the ban system as it evolved in HOTS. We actually started out with no bans in ranked whatsoever. You could just pick whatever you wanted. And then we got one ban, I want to say, or maybe it was two right at the start. And then when Blizzard introduced that third ban, their original plan was actually for the third ban to come in the middle of the draft, as in uh, you would get the one ban at the start and then two bans in the middle. And mm -hmm. it was only due to community backlash that they decided to shift that extra ban 
over to the start of the draft. So I'm just wondering, what would the game look like if it was more of a 2-2, two and two, or even a 2-1-1 two, one, one throughout the draft? It certainly has very interesting implications, and I love what you're saying about how that's something that we as a community can do ourselves. Yeah. Regardless, getting... Getting into the actual game in front of us right here, we see Blaze taken away. One of the top offlaners in the entire game has excellent macro. The Lunara, the Lucio, the Junkrat, those three bands are the same as last game. Notably, Hogger making it through the bands, this time not banned in favor of the Blaze. I feel like we see a Hogger here. We take it away if definitely respecting the Lucio there. They're going to grab Dahaka Vala, though, so still opting for that Dahaka for Slug Hunter, possibly giving the Hogger away. Interesting that, I mean, Dahaka on Tomb, yeah, you don't use the global quite as much, but you can still get speed boosts all over the place. Not so worried about the Dino there. But maybe Slug Hunter's just feeling it. You got some huge drags there in game number one. Maybe he's saying, let me just run it back here for game number two. I mean, ooh. Alrighty, Nasmus on the Urel and Maka playing the Sylvanas. At least when it comes to ladder play right now, which I've been fortunate enough to have some success in, I feel like Sylv is kind of free low. Oh, there's mm. the Tracer ban right there, taking it away yeah. from CPX, not going to be able to pick it up. And Tracer loves to just bully the Vala, bully Dahaka. Not much those heroes can do into it. I think that's an intelligent ban on the side of We Take It Away of. And Sylv, I gotta say, You've got the ability to retool this character into basically whatever you need, and your ability to enable the objective and enable the boss into massive pushing power has to be respected on a map like Tomb. So I just can't wait to see what Maka's able to do with it right here. Do you see that Stitches ban from pre-workout power? I think that's another great ban here. Stitches on Tomb has this ability to either get absolutely nothing done at all or totally take over a game so i think pre-workout power just wants a more even keeled matchup weary day locking the anduin and zergling is going to bring a nazebo here something that we've hardly seen at all nazebo is always a rather polarizing figure i feel like in the competitive circles of heroes of the storm i remember unaverted in particular who we actually see playing on the right side here for pre-workout power had a particularly controversial build running Dead Rush, a uh, bit of a Frankenstein Azebo build, a CPX unable to pick up the Tracer, opts for the Mephisto instead, and Deckard for Legacy. I like this Mephisto. We've got Nazebo, a fairly, you know, there's not a lot of movement abilities with Nazebo. Anduin, same thing. Possibly going to be able to go back and put some damage onto Vala as well. I think this Mephisto is a little bit scary here. Though into Nazebo could possibly run into a zombie wall counter if Zergling can get in range. Tremor's going to bring it on back with the Murden here to round it out for We Taketh Awayeth. And I think this is a really interesting matchup here. Pre-workout power have some great zone control and possibly some great zone lockdown to allow Mephisto to move in and clean up. Mephisto is always, in my experience and opinion, very heavily dependent on the player. You have players that make Mephisto look like the most unbeatable, ridiculously high damage output, just dominating carry. And mm -hmm. you have players on whom Mephisto seems a bit underwhelming. And it makes sense because that's just naturally how the character performs. Oh, the yeah. more damage you deal, the more CDR you get, and the more damage you deal, and so forth. So just, I, I am never 100% comfortable calling oh, I think that this is going to go this or that way outside of a straight hard counter in the presence of a Mephisto because there is so much room for individual player skill expression. Absolutely. I mean, me trying to pilot a Mephisto, absolutely no good at all. And then I see someone else come on in and quadruple my damage and I just realize I've got a long way to go. We'll see how it turns I mean, out that's... here. We're going into game number two. Let's get these teams introduced real quick. We taketh awayeth on the left in the blue. Slug Hunter is on Dahaka. Mason Blaze is on the Vala. Weary Day on Anduin. Zergling on Nazebo. And Tremor is on the Muradin. 
Excited to see Slug Hunter reprise his role as the Dahaka oh, right here. And <laughs> we are reprising today. And CPX bringing it to us on the Mephisto. Nasmus on the Yarel, you love to see it. High skill floor, high skill ceiling character. Legacy on the Deckard with that Sapphire. Unaverted on the Johanna and Amaka rounding it out with the Sylvanas. I'm interested to see whether Sylvanas is going to go for the Mind Control or go for the Wailing Arrow here. If they're going to try to complete this Mephisto setup and go for big spread damage, or if they want to just peel one target away. Because I think you could honestly go both ways with this setup. There's a lot of different ways these things can go, as we see Nazmus and Slug Hunter exchanging blows a little bit in this bottom lane. And you know, whenever I see a Muradin on Tomb in particular, I just think that it is going to be a game largely about rotations. Muradin loves to just make the enemy team uncomfortable because his HP is largely a very free resource. Muradin is able to get health back at the drop of a hat simply by just avoiding combat for a little bit, so he's able to just make your team uncomfortable, in addition to, of course, the ability to jump out whenever necessary. So I think whatever you're seeing a Muradin on Tomb, hold on, there's a zombie wall into CPX in the top lane, followed up by the Thunderclap. CPX getting chunked a little bit right there, but dishing it back out all the same to Zergling. Nobody's gonna go down just quite yet as we see both teams taking their bruiser camps. That could be a preview there. We noted that in draft, Mephisto always comes back to that spot and always comes back at a predictable time. If Nazebo's in range to throw down a zombie wall, Vala might be able to Zergling. jump in there and deal that significant damage as we see Zergling escaping there in the top lane. Bruiser camps gonna be waiting here for We Taketh Away if they're gonna hold that out for just a moment and see if they can get a clear in the mid to allow their camp to push in a little bit further. Yep, and this is something that you also sometimes see on Alterac Pass. Really, whenever you expect to have your camp going into the other team's camp, if you simply delay your capture a few seconds after the opposing teams, then you will get the benefit of being able to clear the camps on your side of the map, having these towers help you clear. It just makes a lot of sense. I love to see that move right there from We Take It Away of Nazmus now joining the fight, followed shortly behind by Slug Hunter. But this is some strong siege coming out with the assistance of Maka's Black Arrows. And now there is the drag onto the mage minion, getting rid of that AoE spell armor for pre-workout power. Both teams' bruiser camps completely dead at this point. Zergling now coming back onto the scene in top lane. And so far, not a particularly bloodthirsty game. We're pretty early going. The Zebo not exactly known for being super bloodthirsty in the early game. Mephisto damage, decent, but really tends to scale up over time. So you're not going to see those big pops like we saw in game number one there with those two, uh, especially pre-workout powers burst set up right from level one on Battlefield of Eternity. So things, yeah, things have calmed down a little bit. Both teams are just getting their chores done. But speaking of getting their chores Asmus done, Nazmus could be in some trouble. Who's running the other way, trying to jump over the wall here. Tremor trying to chase, but it looks like pre-workout power riding into the rescue. I gotta say, I love that move by Nazmus right there. Just uh, maybe not taking the first intuitive move to some players, but running toward their team, even if it means running towards the opposing team's side of the map, able to get that hop, escape into their teammates' arms. However, we do see We Take It Away with now for the first time this game pressuring this bottom siege camp, and it looks like they're going to be able to get it with no issues whatsoever. And we are now at the stage of the game where both teams have enough gems to threaten first turn in. At this point, whatever team is able to get a slight advantage, get a pick here or there, is going to be able to start setting the tone in terms of siege damage. Asmus able to use the Hand of Freedom to get away from the Chastise there, and now the siege camp is starting to make its way up from that bottom area. Unaverted, trying to turn in 11 there, but Zergling throws in the Spiders to deny. Urel being chased out a little bit as Mason Blaze is really chewing on this wall. Legacy gonna have to come on down here. Wow, great chastise, but it may not be enough. Weary Day trying to stay healthy here. Slug Hunter is actually gonna drive them away. Buridan and Nazebo are still on the top side. They're actually oh, gonna be chasing down Mephisto. Gonna be dropping 10 gems there. And wow, oh, Slug Hunter's gonna grab Long another drag. Time. Wow, Johanna a falls. Dung. Oh, Mason Blaze wants Legacy. Oh, the, the self deckered potions are too much. But that's a lot of gems right. on the ground. Pre workout power and can no longer threaten turn in. It was a noble attempt to go for the kill onto the Anduin and bot lane by pre workout power, 
But very notably, they had no damage dealers in that attempt. They had a Johanna, they had a Deckard, and they had a Urel. So even if you get some great CC, you get a nice catch, you're not able to put out the damage necessary to finish that kill. And not only that, you have nobody protecting your teammates over there on the top side. And we see, as I brought up just a moment ago, Tremor's ability on that Muradin to interfere with these rotates. CPX not really able to escape on that Mephisto, not a lot of mobility on that character. As we see some more damage coming out, Zombie while trapping Legacy and CPX simultaneously, brilliantly placed by Zergling, able to get out a lot of damage and force out a healing tap from CPX right here. As we're gonna see this siege damage just go and start right off the bat, getting whatever they can. Objective down past half health as it throws those web waves still onto the invulnerable wells. You love to see it, but the wall is going to be taken down there, and now we see a rotation up top. Reed and Tremor trying to guard this a little bit, forcing Legacy to hold up there as Mason Blaze pushes into Maka. WTA has their 10s, and it looks like they're going to look for Nasmus here. CPX able to get out of trouble. There's the Haunting Spirit, Zergling fishing in that lower corridor, but CPX was out of range. Not quite able to get the pickup right there, but I love Zergling with the aggression, just looking for it, even if it didn't quite work out. And at this point, now with both, both Bruiser Camps respawning, each team looking to take their own, just get them out as efficiently as possible, and now pre-workout power looking to pick up those level 10s here, and this is where things start to get spicy. Once both teams are at this equal talent tier, this level 10, I want to see what they can get done. I love that Zergling has remained committed to getting these stacks. Vala and Anduin, let's go take care of the camp. Let's go take care of the ganks. Nazebo, just keep on walking between those lanes. Sitting on 100 stacks on that level 1 quest so far. Light, Light bomb, bomb engage onto Unaverted there. There's the Reign of Vengeance as well, but they can't quite get in range as they have to move away from the Deckard ult. Slug Hunter waiting for an engage there, but now we've got this spell armor still active for pre-workout power. We take it the way if there's got to worry about this flank from Nasmus. A whole lot of ults used right there, but nobody dead just yet, and we see a beautiful hammer onto Zergling, and Blessed Shield unfortunately doesn't connect for the follow-up. Zergling gonna be able to hit that tap and walk right on out of there. However, this is still an alive bruiser camp for pre-workout power, and they have the web weavers coming in soon, and they want to see if they can take the first fort of the game. Oh, and there's the flank by Nazmus onto Zergling over the wall. Well executed. Zergling should go down. Oh, the zombie wall to get away. Oh. They're caught. Here comes the haunting spirit. CPX moves in, but Tremor has the peel. Slug Hunter is working on Nazmus. Hit the isolation. Mephisto's down. Johan is down as well. Now Nasmus has the instant mount. I don't know if Urel's gonna make it out of here, but Slug Hunter's gonna give chase. Oh, the fort is gonna get the kill. Urel goes down. We take it away at 5 nothing on these kills. This is looking really, really good as they're gonna nullify a big part of this push. And as close as they were to being able to kill Zergling right there, those kinds of attempts are only going to get more difficult as 13 just on the horizon. Nazebo's gonna be able to pick up that ice block. Anduin probably gonna be able to pick up that second pull at 16. Those burst kills are going to become significantly more difficult to come by as this match goes on. Maka, very close to the members of We Take It Away in this top lane. They gotta be aware that this boss is getting taken. No contest whatsoever from pre-workout power down that level 13 as we see a bit of a rotation onto Tahaka bot lane. Slug Hunter gonna be able to move on back there using the speed boost from those vents. Looking like we might have a turn in on top of this boss. They're not able to go for the greedy play because pre-workout power was all on the map where you turn in and then get the boss while the web weaver wave is loading up. Oh, we actually have a double boss stun there, but it is Johanna. Johanna is a very healthy tank and we'll have the iron skin to move on back. Durance barely missing Tremor there, almost getting the key off the knockback of Nasmus. But now we've got a boss. The web weavers are on the way. Haunting Spirit in the back here. Zergling trying to get a little bit of extra damage. Pre-workout power. We'll see if they can back light off. Bomb. There's a light bomb engaged on the three. Four man. Alrighty, Nasmus jumping right over the wall, gonna get on out of there. CPX hit by the Stormbolt Legacy, trying to help him with the stay a while and listen. Hits a potion as well, but CPX is dropping quickly. Wow, the double kill! Mephisto and Jahana both gonna go down as this Web Weaver is knocking on the door of Topkeep. And other than Dahaka, they don't want to go anywhere. They want to pick up this keep 
and they want to open up this map. If this top keep goes down, then they are but one boss away from just being able to absolutely put this game away. A three level lead. At this point, pre-workout power yet again finds himself in a desperate position where at this point, even the slightest misstep means your doom. Slug Hunter landing the tongue onto Nasmus in that bot lane, gonna get hammered away, misses the isolation, not quite able to finish him off. And this Web Weaver, he's going to walk away from it now. Blue team, we take it the way of dominating position in this 1-0 game. Gonna go ahead and take that bottom siege camp. Level 16 advantage just around the corner. And I'm just thinking to myself, Crush, how does pre-workout power get back in this game? It's tough here. I mean, they're not going to be able to dive on the boss. They've still got three minutes on that spawn here. They could look for an opportunity on a gank. We see that We Taketh Away, though, doesn't have enough to turn in, so they don't necessarily have to show anywhere aggressive on the map here. Pre workout power, they might just be sitting back and hoping they can soak out 16 safely. We'll say soaking out 16 does require holding out for a long, long amount of time at this point. Mm -hmm but it does look doable. Uh, I doubt they'll be able to catch anybody out particularly isolated to Haka. Not the easiest target to gank, as we see Unaverted getting a little bit of scouting done with those spinning hammers right there. And now we see a bit of a mid push from We Take It Away if in this mid lane, they're gonna try and get this Bruiser Camp advantage and press that 16 onto this mid keep. Gazebo dueling with Urel there in the top lane. Teams are thinking about moving up, Anduin. Waiting on the edge here. Doesn't want to overcommit. Murden thinking about going up as well, but it looks like they're just going to move on forward with this bruiser. Zebo and Urel can't really do a lot to each other up there, and their <laughs> Urel is a pretty tough one to gank, so not too surprising that We Take It The Wayeth didn't immediately charge their way on up there. We Take It The Wayeth now knocking on the door of mid keep. Their Ooh. bruiser camp is going to go down. That's a pull on Mason Blaze from Weary Day. The Leap of Faith pulling him out. Ravenous Spirit interrupted by the Wailing Arrow. There's a Nazmus flank yet again. Anduin's second pull used, so he's now out of pulls. Slug Hunter taking big slow. damage, but gonna tunnel right on out of there. The movement speed is huge. Ooh, the Reign of Vengeance failing to interrupt Nazmus's jump as we do see the Ardent Defender popped. Nobody going down just quite yet. If you're pre-workout power though, you really wish you could have gotten something there. However, on the other hand, not losing as you wait to scale to 16 is great. They want to just get that 16, take a nice 16 versus 18, maybe 17 versus 19 fight. One of the last chances they're going to have at an equal talent tier fight and hopefully even these things up. Unaverted trying to delay just a little bit here. Every second they can delay this turn in is another second closer to level 16 and, e and an even defense. See Weary Day 4 on the bottom side. Slug Hunter going to have to drop some off. If We Take It The Way It Wants to turn in immediately, they might take the opportunity to push these lanes up just a little bit. It looks like the Haka finally going to finish the job here. In pre-workout power, they've successfully got their 16s. Ooh, we see a bit of a scuffle in the mid lane right here as both teams are on equal talent tiers. There's a lot of damage on Muradin, even with the Leap of Faith not quite enough to save him. And pre-workout power, that's exactly what they needed going into this defense. Now they'll be able to defend 5v4, just absolutely deflating a lot of what We Take It The Way of is trying to do. Very well-timed pickoff right there. Some damage going out onto Mason Blaze. There's the Durance of Hatred not quite connecting. Light Bomb, same oh, story. CPX, CPX is, is going down fast. The Nazebo ult chasing down Mephisto, and now they're looking for Maka. Sylvanas gets caught there. Slug Hunter with another drag, and Deckard Kane is down. The 4v5 triple kill for We Take It Away. If it's only Unaverted and Nazmus left. Bottom lane is pushed up onto the keep. Mid lane is pushed up onto the keep. The objective is going straight to core in the top lane. We'll see if they can go for an end. Unaverted is taking a ton of damage. Johanna goes down. I mean, Manticore doesn't care who you are, Vala's going to shred you. And at this point, this is looking like it's game, just out of nowhere. Wow. I think we are looking at sub 15 minute timings for both game one yeah. and two. And once they put this away right here, we take it away of looking like it'll take a miracle for them not to win. Of course, yep, there it is. There we go. Now, fast, fast 2-0 victory at this point. And now pre-workout power in seemingly no time at all is in an elimination game scenario. This is not what I expected coming into this series. We take it the way it has shown that they are a fantastic team throughout this season, but pre-workout power has shown similar levels of prowess. 
and have definitely brought, you know, they've brought the they brought the hurt to WTA on multiple occasions here. But right now, we take it the way of looking super, super clean in both of these games. They have drastically different play styles in game one and in game two. They played full burst. They played uh, a more team fight uh, aspect oriented game two. And despite these vastly different playstyles, we take it away if just looking like they've got a handle on things. I want to say winning game one 17 to one, winning game two 11 to one. Mm -hmm. At this point, at this point, pre-workout power is averaging about a kill per game. And on the other hand, we take it away if it's averaging about a kill per minute. <laughs> yeah. And that, the, the existence of both of those statistics in the same series at the same time that is just almost mind-blowing to me that you could have such a discrepancy uh, at the moment. But again, I, I don't want to talk like this series is over. We've all seen the gentleman sweep, the reverse sweep. Anything can happen. You take it to a different map. You take it to a different situation. It's not over yet. Things do look dire for pre-workout power, but I'm not counting them out. I want to see what they can do in this game three. I'll tell you something else as well. If you've been catching any Storm Division throughout the uh, throughout the weeks, we take it the way it sometimes has a little bit of a flair for the dramatic. We are in the grand finals, and they might just go hard game number three, or they might repeat a little bit of their past uh, their past preferences and get a little bit sneaky in the draft, try out something a little bit crazy. So we'll see if that's what they're feeling coming up on this game number three, or if they're ready to just try to put this thing away. Show me the juice pirates, you cowards. <laughs> the juice pirates would be... That would be a game number three. That would be something Indeed. else. Especially <laughs> because we are loading up onto our lobby three. It's now up. We're going to be going to Towers of Doom. The oh, greatest the juice, juice pirates, pirates map, map. <laughs> you ever did see. I don't even, can you even cast a back on enemy core? Does it even let you in, in towers? You know, Do you all just get I'm not sure out? if it lets you. I feel like it probably I, would. I have no idea. <laughs> I've just never tried. There's no reason. Yeah. To. <laughs> Someone do it for science. Chat, I need you to go in and try to cast medevac inside the zone. Not just the zone of death, like inside the, the wall and see if it lets you. I feel Everyone like knows. I've definitely so I've definitely seen in clips like an Illidan hunt someone who then teleports behind the wall and he just gets booted out. But that's a little bit different because you're targeting a unit. This is targeting the ground. Yeah. So mm. realistically, mm. Uh, the the real end game meta, as we all know, as every veteran here is the storm player knows, is you try to jump over the core as you're ending so that your player is over the core. Uh, you yes, can do yes. this with a couple characters like Hanzo and Lunara uh, with their jumps, and that's that's always fun. And so similarly on Towers of Doom, the meta is to try to have some memento of yourself on the core, whether it be a dragon arrow, some long range skill shot, something, you know, just be like, hey, there's me on the core. That's, that's what you always want to see right here. But I gotta say, as far as closing the series out, I couldn't think of a better map than Towers of Doom. Towers of Doom is the map of comebacks. It's the map of, yeah, you've been taking a beating. Yeah, you're down 20 shots to four, uh, 20 health to four on your core, but you can still come back. And so mm -hmm. if there's any situation where things look rough, but you need a comeback, it's the one that we see for pre-workout power here in this game number three right here. Looks like everybody's ready. And I'm, I'm just wanting to see the comeback just to keep things competitive. Oh yeah. I'd love to see some more games here tonight because the, the quality has been absolutely fantastic. But our draft is up. Let's jump on in and see what these team comps end up being. We've got we've got the report back from the chat. Spazo says it won't the dropship won't get knocked back, but when the heroes leave it, they all get kicked out. So you can you can fly in there. Kelthanes thinks that the, the ship probably gets shot down before it lands at the core, which is probably true. Well, now we just have to see it for science, of course. As we see the Junkrat band away, 
No Junkrat going to be played in these first three games. No Lunara. These bands have remained constants. Mm -hmm. And uh, it wouldn't surprise me if we see yet another Lucio ban, yet another Hogger or Blaze. This is a bit of a different map than what we have had in the past, but these heroes are still very strong. Lucio in particular, this is a map that tends to go very late game, so you love to get that scaling. This is also another map where Stitches can take things over. Not that I expect to see it early banned, especially with Junkrat already banned away, and now Anduin banned as well. So that's kind of what you expect to see alongside of Stitches. But pre-workout power, trying to remove one of those cleanses. Lucio, another cleanse bot removed. So we might see we might see a slightly higher kill count this game with the uh, the primary save off the board here. Unless of course we find something like an Uther. Uther's pretty good at saving people. You know, I always feel like I got spoiled uh, being able to watch Dignitas back in the day in HGC. And it just feels like, why can't everybody have a JPL and just pick stitches <laughs> in any scenario and dominate? <laughs> uh, and of course, part of that was the long-standing continuity of the Dignitas roster allowed them to pull out that stitches because they were also comfortable with it as a team. And I'm wondering how that aspect of team continuity plays in on the side of We Taketh Awayeth here. Uh, very notably, all having the same team prefix right here. And the double global secured already to Haka Brightwing, take it off the table right now. They want to just have the supreme map mobility here in game three. Going with the Brightwing this time. Double global, Slug Hunter bringing back the Dahaka. And you mentioned just, you know, the comfort level of We Take It Away With here. Obviously, all playing together as part of Wild Heart, previously as part of Heavy Impact. It's it's a, it's a group of players that have been playing together forever here. Pre-workout power, they're not just going to go quietly, though. Unaverted going to snipe away the Muradin, and Nasmus is going to give Abathur a try here on Towers of Doom. They're going to try something crazy. Abathur and Muradin, to me, this indicates a level of aggression that we can expect, expect from pre-workout power. Of course, Abathur lacking a little bit in that early game power, but we do see there's the Genji right there. But a lot of times when you have Abba Muradin, you're playing a very, very heavily rotationally focused game. You're not necessarily looking for the five on fives. You're looking to exploit any little rotational weakness you can find, any ganks whatsoever between these lanes that are fairly far apart. Yeah. And so, of course, the Genji does get taken out. There are still plenty of other options that pair extremely well with an Abathur on the table, though for pre-workout power, but let's see what we take it away it takes right here. Let's go! There's the tracer. You love to see it, folks. I am ready to flame. And <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, whatever you do, Mason Blaze, I, I support it. I endorse it. Let's see that tracer. I'm rooting for you, buddy. Material tracer. Tyrael can pull out some pretty cool tricks here on towers with sanctification. Can go in and aid tracer on moving in on a target here. And also moves around pretty well. I like the extra support possibility from We Take It The Way If. CPX going to respond with a Maev here and Legacy rounding out with a Stukov. Okay, a bit of offlane Abathur, offlane Maev presence right here. It's an interesting approach from pre-workout power. You do need to mix things up a bit at this point. Down 2-0 in the series in this best of five in a do or die situation. I do find it a little bit questionable though. Crush. You know, Tracer had the best win rate, I believe, into Maev out of all characters during the period of HGC <laughs> in HGC matches. That is a character Maev loves to face a team that clumps up naturally. And of course, who is better at avoiding clumping with their teammates than Tracer? Standing off to the side, um, diving the enemy back line, just always looking to be a little bit aloof. It wouldn't surprise me to see CPX struggle a little bit here to find the ability to clump up We Taketh Away If. And outside of the Tracer, this is a very beefy team. This is essentially three tanks, a support, and a Tracer. One thing Maev does bring here for pre-workout power is a, some extra wave clear, a little bit of extra camp clear that can be lacked with Abathur on the map. So we could be, you know, just to make sure the pre-workout power doesn't just lose to map pressure, Maev can definitely help there. But I, I agree. It's going to be tough to get this, this team that, you know, we take it the way of. They're very hardy. They're very, you know, resilient to that type of engage. So we'll see if uh, if they've got what it takes here. 
because we are loading on up. We are getting into the game. We are going to see if We Take It The Wayeth can go ahead with the 3-0. Let's introduce them one more time. On the left in the blue, We Take It The Wayeth. Mason Blaze is on the Tracer. Weary Day on Brightwing. Zergling is on Urel. Tremor on the Tyrael. And Slug Hunter is back again with that Dahaka. And on the right side, for pre-workout power, here in game three, we have CPX on the Mayev, Legacy playing Stukov, Nazmus on the Abathur, Maka reprising his role as the Sylvanas, and Unaverted on the Muradin. And I gotta say, Crush, I'm just looking at these comps, and I, I feel like pre-workout power is not going to be able to get the drop on anybody into a team with these two globals, particularly Brightwing, able to Z onto anybody with that phase shift, whatever they're in danger. And I also think they're going to struggle a bit in the team fights. Maybe Maev's going to be able to get the clumps into this triple melee frontline. But I am a little bit struggling to see how this is going to work. I'd love to be proven wrong, though. Oh, got, hold on. Oh, Zergling in trouble is actually oh, going to be taken yeah. down there. Great job. I think the pairing with Stukov might give this uh, might give this comp the edge. I mean, Maev able to get the tether on people. They try to walk out of the silence. They get pulled back into the silence. It's a whole it's a whole situation here, as we see. Oh, Tremor caught a little bit on the rotation, but Mason Blaze and Tyrael able to warp on out of trouble. I think the Stukov might throw a wrinkle in the plans if we take it away here, and Legacy plays a very very mean Stukov. And I will say, just talking about Legacy Stukov right there, we saw Weary Day attempting to phase shift onto Tremor right in Legacy space, and he said, get that out of here, and he <laughs> hit the lurking arm, got the interrupt, and that's one thing. I know pre-workout power is looking a little bit shaky, a little bit behind in this series, but I have, I know not to count out any of these players. As we see huge damage pressure onto Tremor, gets the phase shift from Weary Day, he's going to be okay. Dahaka Zing in. This is all 10 players are involved in this fight at this point. Mason Blaze getting a little bit of chip damage onto unaverted Ooh. tongue attempt, will not connect, and Slug Hunter needs to slither on back to the offlane at this point. Mason Blaze staying bottom, looking to secure the Sapper Camp advantage. CPX yanking Tremor into lane. Not going to be able to get a kill just quite yet, though. Tremor able to stay alive on that engage attempt. Trying to put out that uh, that shield on the minions to try to keep that Sapper Camp going. But it will ultimately be cleared away. CPX with another nice pull there. As the, uh, the engages from this Maiev have been pretty impactful so far. But they've only got the one kill. Zergling coming on down. There's a big blink in from Mason Blaze looking for some damage onto Maka. Sylvanas is going to survive there. If you love to see the timing of it all, just clearly going in. Uh, the target focus, basic expectation at this level, but uh, still absolutely love to see it after I've been doing some streams in silver lately. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's a different experience. Both teams now pressuring bot lane as we get ready for this first objective, which will come up soon. And I gotta say, as far as power curves go, both teams looking to make their mark early, but can also look forward to some strong late game scaling. Really interested to see how level 10 changes these engages here. There's a lot of good, a lot of very powerful ults on the side of pre-workout power and some very strong ones as well. You know we've seen Dahaka with those isolations do some serious work. Looks like Urel is actually going to the top right to delay this right side turn in. Maka working on the bottom side is going to be delayed here by Tremor. We've got a little bit of a 3v3 situation. The Abathur hat might tilt things in favor of pre-workout power, but we'll see how long we take it the way it can hold out down here. And I gotta say, if your only DPS bottom is Tracer, Tracer not particularly adept at winning fights before level 7, before getting that big power spike in damage, Tremor's unlocked in and loaded. Tremor taking big damage, wow. doesn't sword out, in fact actually swords in. Mason Blaze gonna recall on out of there. Huge tongue on the Maka from Slug Hunter gets interrupted by a well-timed lurking arm from Legacy, but it's not enough to save Maka. Mason Blaze dropping very low, is gonna be forced to back off. Mason Blaze does Weary not day. have a healing fountain. Weary Day going down as well. Weary Day gets caught there. Zergling finally able to make it on down. Great drag onto Legacy. Tower shots are connecting. Knocks back by Urel into the towers. There is the Dark Swarm. TPX not able to get the drag in time, but Dahaka is. There's another kill as we take it the way if they're going to try to chase down Unaverted next. Do they have enough damage? The body blocks are crazy, but Abathur's shielding is enough to save Unaverted. Nice job there by Nazmus to prevent another kill. 
I gotta say, the members of pre-workout power are looking like a bunch of slugs right now because Dahaka is hunting them down <laughs> as we see the invade onto the sapper camp. Don't laugh at that. That was terrible. And now they get the invade uh, pressuring onto this bottom fort. Mason Blaze stepping up right here, and you love to get those sapper camps in. They can fall back to their own whenever they would like. Tremor getting up in there, gonna take a bit of damage. Zergling as well, Zergling actually trouble. dropping very, very low. Skullcracker interrupting the channel on the hammer. Zergling trying to get out of here. Lovely Stormbolt. Zergling oh, go. will go down. Tremor hopping up out of here. Unaverted, it's not done yet. However, the yank from CPX, the damage. Tremor dropping low. Stormbolt does not connect. We'll be able to get wow. on out of there. Only one kill for pre-workout power with the opportunity maybe to pick up a few more, but still a great play in a desperate situation. Good stuff from pre-workout power. I love that Skullcracker pick from Unaverted. Does such great work into your rel. Getting those little micro stuns means all those charged abilities canceled immediately. And that showed there in that chase. Weary Day gets pulled, but is able to get behind the wall there. We see Urel covering the mid, Dahaka pushing in the top. So we take it the way of just trying to survive and grab this experience on the path to level 10, as we have a double altar phase about to come on through. Both teams just heroic spikes just around the corner. Mason Blaze gonna recall to avoid the Umbral Bind right there, not trying to get yanked up in there. Ooh, there's the Shade of Vengeance, not going to connect with anybody just quite yet. Murden getting that level 10 power spike on the Storm Bolt, and we see Zergling immediately pressuring that top turn in, and it doesn't look like anyone is going to stop them. He is able to get it off, and still, not a single point of damage has been dealt to. We take it away with Core. Hold on a second, there's the Wailing Arrow onto Tracer Sanctification, going to get rid of it, unaverted, forced to jump out. So much happening back and forth. Oh, the no. counter synergy with the hammer and the tongue, you hate to see it, but Legacy getting pressured in the back. Zergling going in there, trying to get this last hit onto CPX, double stun into the wall. Slug Hunter on the chase, that's Stukov going down. Maka is the next to go, but Tremor is popped there by the Abathur clone, which will finally expire there. Still a three for one for We Take It The Way Of, and they're gonna see if they can get another channel here, possibly putting the core health of pre-workout power down to 20. Oh, Mason Blaze has gotta watch out for that Abathur hat. Tracer nearly getting caught there. Yeah, Muradin with that Skullcracker, able, able to put surprising pressure uh, as the Tracer player. And I just want to highlight something in particular, this Sticky Bomb choice by Mason Blaze. Mason Blaze is into a healer that has no form of cleanse whatsoever as this Stukov. So that Sticky Bomb, I expect, is going to continue to get big value here in these fights. Even if you miss, Sticky Bomb is a threat. So I love a little bit of that tech right here as we see now we take it the way of approaching the Sapper Camp. Got to have a big invade here. Unaverted is going to catch one. Those Skullcrackers are coming out. Yes. Brightwing is put into the containment disc. Nice shove to get Maka out of that drag. The Slug Hunter goes back in with the isolation. CPX bails out over the wall there. There's the turnaround stun from Unaverted. It looks like the disengage is there. Camp does go over to pre-workout Power, and that's going to help them out as they are currently behind about half a level on the path to level 13. At this point, half core HP for pre-workout power. Still yet to get a shot onto the core of We Take It The Way If There's the stun onto Tremor, followed up by Stukov, who gets very instantly polymorphed by Weary Day, cutting off that lurking arm. There's the phase shift, just topping off Tremor, making sure everybody's full HP here. But this is a three on four in bot lane. Oh, huge this. silence on a Tremor. <laughs> Not quite able to finish him off, even with the Wailing Arrow. Looking for the finish. There's a stun on the Tracer. Mason Blaze recalling on oh, out. Wow. Does get hit by the Containment Disc, but we see Slug Hunter on the scene. Sanctification popped early there as Slug Hunter coming in looking for a flank. But it quickly bails on out as Yurel is looking for a channel on the top side. It's another, another double altar phase. Slug Hunter wants to drag onto Unaverted, but couldn't get the dismount. And Zergling is not going to be able to get this quick channel here. 13s are in for We Take It The Way, though that's quickly going to change here for pre-workout power. And it looks like Maka is going to get the first channel for pre-workout power over and done with. A little bit of a trade up here in the top lane. Yeah, and I mean, when you're at this kind of stage as We Take It The Way, you're perfectly comfortable taking those trades. You know that pre-workout power is going to run out well before unaverted oh. coming down heading back towards mid there's zergling interrupting the jump polymorph sticky bomb that's a lot of pressure on unaverted 
Unaverted is taking a ton of damage, but look at the lurking arm there from Legacy, forcing out the Ardent Defender there from Zergling, pulled back in by Maya. Knife resets trying to come on through, and that is Urel going down. Tracer is going to be silenced out of this by the Containment Disc and by the lurking arm. There's the double kill. They're going to see if they can get a pull onto Tremor. Umbral Bind connects. There's the Skullcracker. The Unaverted has nasty. the body block. That's a triple kill for pre-workout power. What a positional play by Unaverted. And for one of the few times in this entire series, and maybe the first time in this series, pre-workout power leading in kill count 10 minutes into the game. Slug Hunter attempted to get some of that pressure onto the side lane. And honestly, we take it away if as much as that was not 100% desirable, they're still sitting pretty as far as this game goes. Not significantly behind, inexperienced, not losing that mid bell tower just yet, but this is a general strat for Towers of Doom. You take an enemy bell tower very low, you don't quite finish it off, and then it's there whenever you want to go ahead and finish it. And like the now choice. we see... Mason Blaze barely getting away there. I was looking like a Zapper's possible getting blocks for just a moment. Zergling There's an upper bind on the Zergling disc. Nice disengage, though. Okay. Reworkout power forced to move back to Haka, doing the similar strata in the top lane, getting the top bell tower very low, and will be able to dig on in for this fight. 16 is not close. There's a Stormbolt going to connect. CPX going to get a triple umbral bind there. Lurking arm on the edge is there is the sanctification in the back. They're looking for Muradin. They found the Stukov. Stukov is going to go down here. Unaverted trying to board away in the back line. Here comes the ultimate evolution. CPX gets over the holy ground, but still taken out there by Zergling. There's a double kill. Nazma's trying to mix it up in the back, but that clone is going to expire. And the chase is on. They find another drag on a Muradin. Oh, and interrupting the jump yet again. I feel like I just saw this in mid lane, and here it is once more. The pressure on Damaka. Mason Blaze backing off. It's a oh, little Zergling bit too dangerous. Wants it. Zergling running in. Zergling wants it. Oh, whoa, nice. the dodge by Maka. Well timed. There's the Critterize from Weary Day. Looking to set up whatever they can with that armor reduction for these burst kills. And I, I think that... A little bit of what happened there in that bottom fight, as we see, we take it the way of taking out this bottom bell tower before looking for the objective, trying to squeeze out any extra shots they can. I feel like a little bit of what happened is that we notice a reactive ballista spores on the side of Legacy. I think that may have baited him into stepping forward well, a bit and then getting dived by the Dahaka as we see yet another fight in bot lane. CPX is going to get the camp steal here and then vault on back to safety. Cheeky plays there from pre-workout power are going to ease up the pressure a little bit here in the bottom lane. Camp is going to be tried to be cleared on the spot, but it's finally broken free here. If my count is correct, the next phase is a triple altar phase, which is going to be very important for pre-workout power to try to stabilize here. Massive Shove going to send Zergling on back. Towers are upgrading. We have another engage possibility as the defense continues in the bottom lane. And now at this point, once you've got control of that bottom bell tower, you just want to do whatever you can to prevent it from being taken back away from you. Zergling getting phase shifted by Weary Day. The responses from Weary Day onto the correct target every time, and they're basically instant. Nazmus cloning the Maya, bringing it in. There's Ardent Defender popped. Tremor dropping very low on that material, trying to get on out of here. Tremor. Zergling in the lurking arm, gonna get yanked into the back line. They're gonna finish him off. 1-0 in favor of pre-workout power in this fight. They're gonna go and try and get this bell tower Look back. The sticky recall bomb. into the sanct. Huge sticky bomb value. Slowing everybody. CPX now dropping very low. Massive tongue onto Unaverted. Will be able to drop out. Tremor dropping now. Two kills. Nothing in favor of Red. Never mind. Two for one. Weary Day dropping very low. Finished off by the Abathur. Mason Blaze and Slug Hunter still diving around, but the tower is going to go back to pre-workout power. Mason Blaze has a move to get away. Slug Hunter, low on resources, is finally going to go down. Pre-workout power. They're looking for Mason Blaze. Where's the Stormbolt? Massive shove. Not going to connect either. Tracer gets on out of there, but Mason Blaze not even going to have a chance to work on a cheeky cap. Pre-workout power is going to lock in all three of these altars. Not even able to go for the Abathur or anything like that. Just too far back, too threatened. Mason Blaze gravitating down a little bit as we see the boss. And at this point, as much as boss is to do damage, I feel like pre-workout power is taking this boss to take it off the map so that it's not an option for we take it away. 
Because Absolutely. With this, with this, that that four core HP is more than a third of their remaining core health. They just want to remove the option. Sapper Cap gonna respawn in five seconds for pre-workout power. That's certainly on both teams' minds at the moment. As we do see, we take it the way of Sapper Camp approaching that bottom bell tower. Both teams about even in experience, but a large core HP lead in favor of We Take It The Way of still anybody's game. Despite getting all three of those shots, only nine core health peeled away from WTA's core. You see to hog up in that top lane, looking for a possible push onto Abathur up there. Durell's going to rotate on down once again. But with those late kills, pre-workout power have evened up the experience count. They're exactly on path to find their level 20s and that's where these fights get super super interesting you love to see the 20s i want to see somebody get stuffed personally <laughs> oh stormbolt over the wall on the tremor attempting the silence combo virulent reaction just inches off of getting the stun combo onto the muradin it's not technically a stun it's a root in the silence but it's basically the <laughs> same thing Alter spawning in 20 seconds, level 20 achieved for We Take It Away. If the same will come for pre workout power in just a moment. The Hawk is pushing three shots in in the top lane here. Slug Hunter is going to convert those to bring the core health down to eight as our single altar phase is spawning. The Hawk is going to come in in the back and to find a quick drag onto Muradin. Zergling going to get the knockback as well as CPX goes into the back line of WTA. Nasmus is in, but he's getting quickly burned out there by We Take It The Way That's pretty big. Another interrupt on the jump! Unaverted is going to have to hit the rewind. There is a huge sanctification guarding everybody. Legacy in trouble. Stukov is going to go down. Unaverted at the avatar mode trying to survive survive here. Tremor chasing down Maka as well, and we take it the way of absolutely controlling that fight. Unbelievable there. The sanctification was money. The sanctification, the ability to get Stukov just in the middle of their backline as we see the mule for stall <laughs> used right there by Nazmus, but it's not going to be enough. Weary Day able to get this turn in, and at this point, pre-workout power, only three core HP remaining. Unaverted running away near this boss pit, gonna get chased down by Mason Blaze a bit, will be able to dwarf toss himself right on out of the action. This and is where you see, this is where you see why it was a good idea for pre-workout power to take that boss. If they hadn't taken that boss earlier, game's over right now. We take it the way it just runs in ends the game. As it is, they've got to try to take this bottom lane, they've tried to Got to try to get some more sappers in, which is a significantly harder win condition. Especially if Unaverted just goes and tries to find a kill right now. Double Stormbolt is CPX and Maka trying to catch up here. Slug Hunter's on the flank. Here they able to blink on out of the action. Mason Blaze pressuring the back line. Unstoppable for Sylvanas is used, trying to make sure they're as safe as possible. Sapper Camp approaching for We Take It Away onto this bottom. And at this point, pre-workout power needs to play an extremely clean game to finish this off. Clone Mayev running in here for Nazmus, but completely in vision. They are able to run Mason Blaze. Gonna finish off Slug that clone here. here. Slug Hunter on the flank. Great massive shove is gonna send Dahak away, away there. Big knockback from Zergling is unaverted, tries to chase into the back. There is Dahaka again, mixing it up. There is Tyriel put into the containment disc. Slug Hunter's got a drag, but is stunned out there. Silenced as well, gets out of the lurking arm, and Slug Hunter is going to be all right. Unaverted tries to go in there, finds the double stun, but there is another huge sanctification. Mason Blaze tossed away. CPX wants to find the Umbral Bind, but it gets disconnected. Unaverted goes in once again, and the brawl will not stop. Brawl's not going to stop. Pre-workout Pallet knows they need to get something. They need to try and finish oh, off this game. Seraphim allowing us. Zergling to walk out of that. Oh no, bringing the Sticky Bomb to his teammates. CPX now retreating into his team, unaverted, dropping a little bit low. Mason Blaze Tremor's looking for trouble. the damage, unaverted, jumping on Tremor. There's the containment disc. On to Yorel. Tracer with the recall. Both teams trading so much, but nobody's going down. It's do or die for pre-workout power. Zergling running in there with the hammer and still Slug's nobody channeling. dropping. Slug's channeling. Mach is going to head on up there. The Apather has the mule to try to delay and will do so. Slug Hunter being chased out. CPX able to barely get away. Another massive shove is going to send Zergling away. 
Tahaka in some trouble. Has the burrow to get on out of there. Mason Blaze is going to dive onto Maka. There's a holy ground sticky bomb as well. But Maka has the bolt of the storm to move on back. CPX being pushed away by Zergling as the fight is now split. Tahaka is going to go down though. There is Zergling being chased away. Urel in big trouble. Gets the heal. Tyriel is put into the containment disc. And Zergling get on out of here. Virulent reaction on Brightwing. Brightwing in trouble oh. on the low side. Oh my gosh, Yorel is getting out. Nasmus with a pull. Yorel wow. finally goes down. And pre-workout power going to secure the four shots. And they hang on. Your pre-workout power. That's exactly what you needed right there. Getting the split right there. Not exactly what my FCOMs tend to thrive in. But just beautifully splitting up the members of We Take It The Way Of. Getting that pressure. Getting this bottom bell tower very, very low. Boss is on the table here as we see a rotation toward the top side of the map, unaverted, going in, going to clear out this top wave. Near three members of We Take It Away, if they're walking away, we see the danger pings. There's CPX looking for the tug, not going to be able to get it onto Weary Day, who's able to uh -oh. blink heal out, but there's the combo onto Tremor. Rewind. Tremor's in trouble. Silence goes out. Tyrael is going to fall. Now Brightwing is silenced for a moment, trying to bring, bring it on back. Sticky Bomb is going to prevent further engage there from Murden, but a great timing on that pick. Legacy is going to shove the Hako away next, and they may be looking for a six cap here. Six cap after everything that's happened in this series would be so wild, but there's yet another tongue onto Legacy. Slug Hunter able to sidestep the Storm Bolt, but it's not enough to save his life. This fort is going to go down, and we are, in fact, going to see a six cap. I saw it called in the chat by Rhett. He said, game gets so hard at 20 for We Take It. And I got to say, Rhett, you're getting vindicated right now with the state of how this game is going. The six cap is here. The two altars, the disc onto your rail. I don't think they're going to be able to turn that into a kill. And that is going to be permanent shots just decrementing down the core HP. Nasmus with yet another clone gets the double tug, the double bind. Stormbolt not connecting in the bottom lane. Maka hopping the wall. Look at the Let's mule healing do. off the keep. This is huge plays. Zergling is being pushed out. Has to Seraphim to survive. Ultimate evolution is taken down here. Maev is working on the channel. We take it the way if they've got to move up. There's the sanctification. They've got to dive onto this keep. Sticky Bomb lands, the core is down to four. The shots are raining in quickly. Mayev is looking for the channel. The shots have stopped, but CPX is gonna complete this channel and pre-workout power is gonna complete the comeback here in game number three. That is just not what I expected at all. In a series where pre-workout power just looked honestly outclassed in games <laughs> oh one and gosh. two and then to come into game three and just get the first blood just right away just come up and just bam smack them and then bring those team fights and bring that post 20 power you absolutely love to see it legacy got caught a few times in that early game but then just the late game just shaking out so well in mm. favor of pre-workout power who now are only down one two and this is what I've been waiting to see. I've been waiting to see them mix it up a little bit, bring a different playstyle that allows them to compete. And you know what I think this boils down to, Crush? What does it boil down to, Mockery? It boils down to Tracer didn't pick Ricochet at 16. I, I love that you asked it's that. It's gonna Thank come you, down. <laughs> Everyone got away with seven health. I saw it. Wait, Still. no, no, no. It actually boils down to we have a composition B pick. Never mind. Hold on. Hold on. What's going on here? <laughs> Taking a quick look at, at the stats. Mason Blaze did get over 100,000 hero damage there on that Tracer. Very nicely played. Maka and Sylvanas. I mean, all eyes were on Maev and the Abathur turning into a Maev, but sneakily, Maka just putting up over 120k damage that game on the Sylvanas. It is absolutely huge as the sole ranged character on your team. Uh, a lot of that damage dealing pressure is going to be on you as Maka. Maka certainly not disappointing, able to hit some valuable damage, and most importantly, able to just stay alive. You see those defensive talents locked in, Will of the Forsaken, Bolt of the Storm, and I do want to draw your attention here to that Remorseless at level 13. Uh, just the ability to have a talent where when you shoot someone, it bounces off extra shots to other people. That's such a crazy talent, and I feel like you would just pick something like that uh, extremely commonly if you had the option. I don't know of any other characters that have anything remotely similar. 
uh, that perhaps could have been taken but did not. <laughs> Wink. <laughs> but what a great performance by pre-workout power right here. Getting dangerously low. And did I call it or did I call it? You know, getting down low. I said they'd get down to four core HP. Uh, that was my example. No, they got down to three core HP <laughs> yeah. and still able to maintain the composure and bring out the W. And all of a sudden, this is a momentum shifter crush. This, this isn't is looking a, like a done uh, yeah. deal anymore. When, when you go from averaging one kill a game to getting 16 kills in game three and the absolute heartbreaking victory for We Take It Away With, like heartbreaking uh, for We Take It Away With, the victory for pre-workout power in that game three, all of a sudden I know that the morale has shifted, the conversations have shifted, and th that's gotta be just an influx of energy for mm -hmm. pre-workout power. We'll see if they can ride that wave. We'll see if they can get that energy, that you know, that pre pre workout boost, as they are often known to bring. This looks like we pre have our next just needed lobby a bit of time up. to kick in. You know, <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> Looks like our next lobby is up. We'll get you the invite here, and we are going to Infernal Shrines here for game number Sorry. two. I'm just waiting to see which team is actually first pick because they all switched. Because sometimes they set What's it up that? and then it's all messed up. But okay, team one is you. supposed to be first pick. Fantastic. It took me a little bit to get into this game four lobby because I was just so entranced by that bullet spray composition B. You know, I, I just, <laughs> just couldn't take my just eyes off Just locked in, it. locked in on yeah. that talent screen. Bakri <laughs> shaking. <laughs> Spray, I'm seething huh? over here in my chair. Yeah, I'm frothing at the mouth. <laughs> and, uh, we are I, I going. Also... Uh, we are going to Infernal Shrines. This is the first map pick of pre-workout power for this game. Though we take it away, it did have the first pick and the map pick for game number one. So it will be uh, the second time that we take it away. It has the first pick in this series. And I gotta say, uh, we spoke about it a little bit last night when we were doing our previous cast, but uh, in my personal map tier list, the two maps that I have placed at the very top, Infernal Shrines and Towers of Doom. We see game three on Towers of Doom, we see game four gonna be on Infernal Shrines. You love to see just the quality map choices and surely quality gameplay about to follow it up. And like I mentioned a bit with Battlefield of Eternity being a rather open-ended map, with lots of alternate viable play styles and win conditions, Infernal Shrines is also excellent about that. Infernal Shrines is very unique as a map in that the mercenary camps do not despawn during the objective yeah. uh, and that there are ample opportunities for back doors. So you're not restricted to solely trying to win through the objective. You have a lot of different ways to try and apply pressure and win the game on Infernal Shrines. And again, this is where we see some of that individual team spice about to play out here in game number four. I'm interested to see what it's going to be. We saw in game number one, we take it away of taking a very objective focused composition, which is something you can run here on Infernal Shrines. You might do something like, you know, a Decker double bruiser to just try to control the area. But like you said, you can run split push. You can do all sorts of really fun stuff and make it work here on Infernal Shrines. This is a map we've seen show galls. We've seen death wings, we've seen all sorts of stuff. One thing that you know hasn't really been a factor at all in this series that might be here is the Tychus. I think that's going to be something to look out for in this draft. Yeah, there's just so many different options that you have. Hogger getting taken away, not messing with that business in the slightest here. Nobody wants to see those infinite spins. Junkrat, of course, still not going to see the light of day in this series. And Maka Sylvanas, after performing so well in that previous game and after having been run in game one, they're going to say, no, 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 you're not bringing that back on to us. You're not reprising that Sylvanas here in game four. I'm going to use that word every game. It's so <laughs> good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you love the reprisal. When, when we cast available. yesterday, we said reprise every game. We did. We <laughs> oh, did. there's the Hanzo first pick from Mason Blaze. Mason Blaze is going to bring the Hanzo. We'll see if pre-workout power wants to snatch up that Lunara or if they've got something else in mind here for their first two picks. Anzu Lunara, I mean, you could run it together. It's a little bit flimsy, so they'd have to be a little bit careful about how they pick it. 
but it's, yeah. uh, it's a possibility. Into, if you go into Hanzo Lunara, I think that that's so dangerous versus yeah. a player like CPX who has shown that he has Genji in his hero pool and he has Tracer in his hero pool. Uh, both heroes able to pressure such a squishy backline, unaverted taking that Diablo. And I think it's so fitting that Diablo is fairly strong on Infernal Shrines, being that it's a Diablo map, uh, and it's a map where you fight in corridors so often, giving Diablo just the opportunity to really just pack up those apocalypses, hit everybody with lightning breath, and of course hit those big wall bangs. Slug Hunter gonna be on that Leoric this time, and the Anduin not getting banned out in game number four, weary day on the Anduin. Interesting, interesting setup here. We taketh awayeth, opting for an early Leoric. You know, you, you can put some pressure on Diablo. Leoric, great double soaker, of course. When I look at this setup, I feel like We Taketh Awayeth is building a little bit more towards the late game power, as we see Garrosh and Brightwing next to be banned away. Do you think pre-workout power might be going into a double support with this Vala? It is certainly an option. I wonder um, if they have I... a Medivh on side, because this looks very Medivh-y as well. That would be quite Medivh-ious. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> as we see... Now, pre-workout power, just about to there show us the three, four, yes! you called it! You called it, Crush! And I gotta say, I love this particular pairing of the Medivh and the Malfurion. Malfurion, a very strong sustain healing support, able to follow up on those Diablo stuns and flips with the entangling roots, but notably very poor in the anti-burst compartment department. Medivh, on the other hand, exceptional at preventing bursts. So it's a natural complementary pairing between these two characters with the double support. They're looking for strong team fight control, but of course, what hero functions better into double support than Mephisto? Able to bring out such ridiculous truckloads of damage in the late game, in the five on five, on these shrines. Absolutely, Mephisto, a great pickup here from We Taketh Awayeth. See what Nasmus is going to grab here for pre workout power. Probably just something with an overabundance of wave clear. Diva can, Diva can do some decent wave clear. Not quite as much as when we had the OP Diva patch, but does just fine and does some pretty good zone control here on the shrines. And can go back there and mess with Mephisto nonetheless. I just think that generally Mephisto has seen a lot of success being used to be able to pump out so much damage that he's able to match up well even into double support. Double support, if you're not into something that particularly functions well into it, that uh, such as countering healing from the Ana, from the Deckard, from the Malthale, things like that, or a Mephisto, double support can kind of just run away with those five on five team fights. But the presence of that Mephisto from Zergling, I almost wonder if there's a bit of Cav influence right there. I know Zergling and I both coached by Cavalier Guest, and he is particularly a big fan of Mephisto as a way to shut down double support. I will say also, Crush here, there's something that my heart wants, but I'm not quite sure we're gonna get this series in this particular game. What do you think That's about? That's the Int Dragon Strike. It's, you know, it's possible. But into into the Medivh, <laughs> probably somewhat less possible. Probably somewhat less it's not, advisable. It's not gonna happen, but I just I <laughs> want it. You know, I I just want to hear the. It's it's just at, at the Hanzo player in me just desires it. I know it's not gonna happen. Hanzo actually obscuring his level one Q choice. And let me go ahead and let you uh, introduce the players here. We are here. It's game number four. We take it away on the left in the blue. Tremors on the Muradin. Mason Blaze is on the Hanzo. Weary Day on Anduin. Zergling on the Mephisto. Slug Hunter playing Leoric. The Cypog X. Some damage done, but Mephisto or Medivh can end up just fine. Who's on the right? Different M character. And now over here, wait, that's a huge pull onto Zergling. Gonna yank him all the way into there. And now I'm not sure why I said a pull, I'm too used to the Maev's presence in the last game. But for the right side for pre-workout power, we have CPX playing the Medivh at six stacks already after that level one fight. Diablo played by Unaverted. Vala on that auto attack. 
or sorry, Maka on that auto attack, Vala, Legacy on the Malfurion, and Nazmus on D.Va. I thought that Nazmus wasn't a big fan of D.Va after some of her nerfs recently, but this is a particularly strong map for her. Able to bring that high level of shrine control with those bombs, I am excited to see how it's going to play out right here. We take it the way of jumping on their left side, Siege Camp immediately. And it looks like they are going to make their way down here. Tremor is watching. We may have a classic 90 second all in on this camp. Leo and D.Va not exactly in the area, so we might just have the 4v4 here. See if Tremor wants to step Diva's up onto this point. Especially with the portal. D.Va's arrived, now... but Leoric has not. We take it the way if they're going to have to back away. An expertly timed and placed portal by CPX right there, allowing D.Va to pressure just long enough to force We Take It The Way to step away from the camp, but still portal away to not miss too much in terms of rotational priority and taking care of that offlane. Of course, both teams will start looking at these bruiser camps soon. Tremor with the Deep Scout, Weary Day similarly, but will get scouted out by the Medivh Bird because, of course, that hero is Map Hacks. And now Slug Hunter and Nazmus trading a bit of damage in the top lane. Nazmus just about on the cusp of having a self destruct ready, which they are going to look to want to hold for this first objective. Ideally, pre workout power gets to hold that bomb until the objective pops up. Sometimes we see teams go and try to gank a D.Va just to force that bomb to come out, as we see a little bit of pressure onto this right side camp from We Take It The Way Of. Slug Hunter is here, Tremor's gonna jump on the point, and we may have ourselves a counter camp steal as Diablo, with nowhere to go, wasn't able to click on that portal, and will go down. And it's, it's just so interesting to see that play out. Pre-workout power able to threaten the D.Va rotation for that bottom siege camp. They get the five on four. And then similarly, we take it the way of 5 v 4 on that invade slug hunter just a second too late. Not quite able to go for that pressure. Maka able to vault right on out of there. And now we're going to see a bruiser camp advantage in favor of pre-workout power. Wow. Forcing Slug Hunter to stay a little bit longer in that top side, and that is a very quick, very early self-destruct from Nazmus. Nazmus is trying to jump on that lead immediately while Leoric is still clearing the top side camp. We take it the way it wasn't able to get their bruiser camp before they had to come on in here, and now pre-workout power with a significant lead on these minions. Slug Hunter coming on down to try to drive out pre-workout power. Nice protect bubble is unaverted, gonna shadow charge to a minion to get away. Slug Hunter taking a lot of damage here. Nazvis is gonna get that mech popped. Circling going into the back, trying to put some damage in, but pre-workout power is still very much ahead on this shrine. Tremor able to jump on out after getting flipped oh. by Diablo and Zergling going down right there. And this is going to be an easy first objective for the side of pre-workout power. Now able to get some push off right here. Going to try and shred these buildings with that Vala sustained damage. And Diva actually going to be in charge of catching the bot soak as we see Medivh catching that top soak into Slug Hunter. At this point, they're going to try and get whatever damage they can onto this mid gate. Vala able to output such high levels of sustained damage. They're not going to be able to get this first mid fort. Hold on, there's a stun onto Tremor, but it's a bird and they're not going to be able to get the kill. Punisher will go down soon. With that frozen Punisher, Diablo just able to give him the high how are you before backing out without taking any shots from the structure. Structure is going to be saved though, and looks like Tremor caught a little bit on this rotation, but Tremor's playing Muradin, and rotational damage doesn't mean anything. When you're into double support, any kind of chip damage you get just feels like it kind of didn't even happen, to be honest. <laughs> and we see pre-workout power yet again, threatening to take this camp, and with the D.Va significantly closer to them with this double support comp, it's basically just theirs for the taking. No contest from We Take It Away If, who have now seeded two of these bottom siege camps at the moment. They are taking this. There is full vision, I must remind you, from the Medivh bird, so the invade is being threatened by pre-workout power. CPX thinking about ferrying them in, but just, uh, just checking, just checking. WTA would yeah, with back off of there, but... With the Bluff presence of Slug Hunter, they just couldn't go for it. Yeah. Diva and Leoric will move across each other in that top lane corridor. This looks like another rotational portal is going to be coming on out here. But uh, pre-workout power, they're actually not going to take the portal. They're going to have to stay here, as it looks like Diva is grabbing that soak. Both teams very close to their level 10s. No one's got a significant XP advantage at this point, as we're loading up for our next shrine in the bottom lane. 
And now some vision being granted by the Hellfire and by Medivh on a Verdict Scouting for just a moment. Step it up to Slug Hunter. We'll get the flip Wraith walking right on out just long enough to escape. We see a portal bringing in Nazmus on the flank, and nothing really is going to happen at the moment. Maka checking. Zergling going to just... Another high, how are you? This time from Mephisto, <laughs> just going over the wall there, putting some damage. Tens are starting to come online. Nice stun onto Mediv there from Tremor to make sure there wasn't any further engage there. Everything looking pretty normal on the heroics front. Nothing yet from Murden, though. We'll see if it's possibly holding a Haymaker here for Tremor. And there it is! Haymaker to try to push people off of those portals. Oh, there is Endurance. the Endurance of Hatred from Zergling. Not gonna connect. And I will remind you that you cannot get into a portal while you are rooted. So it wouldn't surprise me if we see a high level of interaction, or at least attempted interaction, between Zergling's Durance of Hatred and CPX's Dark Portals right here. Now, with this objective coming up soon, both teams are definitely going to want to take their Bruiser Camp, get that top lane perma pressure during this objective. Mid Siege still alive for pre workout power. Both teams just going to take a moment to form up. Nazmus has got a bomb ready already. You love to see it. And I think we're going to see, a, 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 just as we saw in the first objective, probably a hair trigger on that self destruct yet again. Diva's there first. We might, yeah, I mean, this is a pretty similar situation. Nazmus might just pop it and go, I just want 10 right away. Gonna hold it for now. Slug Hunter has been seen. There's the boost. Nazmus trying Hello, something a little, little bit tremor. different here. Gonna hold the bomb for a moment as Slug Hunter takes a couple of those minions. Wow, actually 10 minions over to WTA. A lot of good last hits there before the rest of the team could come on in. Now both teams posturing oh, at the moment. The team can hit the ley line onto just Mephisto. The follow-up attempted, but a well-timed arrow from Mason Blaze will land onto Unaverted. Going in there, wow, the stun on the Tremor. How did he find that angle? The light, uh, the, <laughs> the lightning breath able to get the pressure. Muradin going down right at the start of this fight. Yet again, just securing a timely kill. Nazmus did use that self-destruct, building it back up. And there's the Durance of Hatred landing on the mouth. Not quite able to get the kill, though. They bring out the bubble, there's the light bomb, there's Leoric hitting onto three on the push back. Zergling putting some damage out, Nazmus getting low, but it's still just the mech. Slug Hunter gonna try to get a couple of last hits here, maybe inting for it though. It is just Leoric, only five more hits needed, but Zergling, oh, he's gonna be saved by Weary Day. And now we take it away, if not able to get any more hits, pre-workout power gonna lock themselves up another objective. Tower. Oh, there's the Haymaker knocking Unaverted there's under so the much, towers. There's so much healing. Unaverted is just waiting. There's the bubble. <laughs> Tremor is low. Tremor's actually being chased out, and it's Murden that's going to go down. Unaverted Protected, just waiting way. for a train there on the bottom side. Actually has to walk away there. <laughs> was taking some Unaverted shots. Unaverted just gets knocked behind enemy gate. Just calm, cool, and collected. Says, hey, <laughs> I've got a Medivh. I'm Diablo. I am one tanky fella right there. I am not worried about this situation. A strong advantage for pre-workout power. They've got the XP lead. They've got this healthy Arcane Punisher dropping in, buying them time to get the siege onto the mid fort and an invade on this camp over here for Nazmus, who has yet another self-destruct almost lined up. It is very, very close. And pre-workout power just in the driver's seat for this entire game so far. This Mediv comp is doing great things there. The alts showing to be in favor of pre-workout power, at least in that first engage there. We'll see if the um, the Durance, if the Haymaker can possibly separate one out here for We Taketh Away if, and turn things around for the next shrine. But pre-workout power, they've really opened up the map here. Diva is just grabbing every camp possible. Pre-workout power looking to soften up the top lane next. And we take it the way if they're certainly not locked out of the map just yet, but things are not going the way they'd hoped. Yeah, we take it the way if I must point out onto this next middle mortar shrine that's about to come out does not have a fort, meaning that not only do they not have the safety and sanctuary of it, but they also don't have a healing fountain, a privilege that pre-workout power does have available to them. So pre-workout power, double support, and healing fountain, it is going to take a monstrous effort by We Take It Away in order to win this next objective. However, this is still anybody's game so far in a relatively low kill count match, only six kills in the first 11 minutes of the game so far. 
Both teams posturing in mid lane. Pre-workout Powell would love to get a big advantage off this next objective. Because going into a Mephisto Leoric level 20 is definitely something they don't want to spend too much time doing. If pre-workout power can get a significant enough advantage before those 20s come online, that's going to really, really favor them in the late game. We take it away if they might be able to make something happen before then, but so far, the post-level 10 fights have absolutely been pre-workout power all the way. Yeah, just the ability to absolutely dominate with double support, that's nothing new. And of course, we're about to see probably temporal flux on the side of Medivh, and yep, there it is, getting that heroic ability cooldown reduction. We might expect to see multiple leyline seals per fight at this point. It's going to be a lot of disruption for pre-workout power. However, speaking of 16s, I fully expect 100% bet the farm on it. We're going to see piercing arrows from Hanzo. Also a very significant power spike in terms of this map, increasing his ability to defend against this objective and to secure it themselves. Of course, Nazmus has a self-destruct yet again, ready for this Bruiser Camp, well-timed by pre-workout power, but both teams have a 16 going into this objective. 16s are here. We'll see who's got the better spike. We'll see who's got the better positioning. Diva down in the bottom lane to start things out here. Top lane is going to be cleared up by We Take It Away. So pre-workout power able to jump onto the point. Diva is now on the way. Baka going to start this up immediately, and now the fight is beginning. Light Bomb is going to come out early here, going to find a quick stun onto Diablo, still at full health. Durin's into the back line is going to catch Medivh. Lightning Breath coming on out from Diablo is another Protect Bubble, going to keep Unaverted's health high. Leyline Seal already below half cooldown. Can you believe it? Temporal Flux, <laughs> what a crazy ability. And now an early lead on this shrine from pre-workout power. We take it the way of honestly looking a little bit unorganized line. in these oh, fights. There's the dragon arrow. Dragon arrow coming out as well. Zergling putting in some big damage is unaverted looking for a pin. Mephisto resets are coming in hot. Pre-workout power being forced to back away here, but they only need five more minions. We'll see if we take it the way it can keep them off this point. Micro missiles. No last a hits. Master shield for Zergling right there. Oh, and there's Tremor getting knocked away. Sorry, Unaverted getting knocked away from the portal. We'll be able to land the stun combo onto Zergling. Desperate Prayer keeping him up, but Leoric will go down, followed by Mephisto. 2 0 in favor of pre workout power. They're still portaling in. They want more Mason Blaze, making it 3 0. Oh, the and catch. there's a ley line seal. Can they make it 4 0? There's the leap of faith, Weary Day. They're not done. Oh, they might make it 5. They find the pin. The Punisher is going to jump in and chase towards the top lane and Muradin goes down pre-workout power get the objective they get the ace slug hunter is going to be back in a moment but this could be keep and this could be more at this point with these death timers as long as they are with a punisher as healthy as this is slug hunter can jump that punisher can bait it towards bottom a little bit we'll get the entomb on to maka but of course they are against a medivh they are against double support that damage is only temporary at best at this point this is a very healthy punisher stepping forward a two level lead in favor of pre-workout power slug hunter dropping very very low baiting this punisher away leyline seal does come out but this core is dropping fast the Punisher is back on the core. We're down to 50% here. Pre-workout power just dancing around, just trying to buy time. Light Bomb goes in with the stun onto three. Mason Blaze is trying to kite the objective away. There's the Lightning Breath, though, and that is going to be it. Pre-workout power have evened it up and are going to force a game number five. If you had told me at the end of game two that this is how games three and four were gonna look i would be very surprised <laughs> this has been this has been the story of these teams it's you know it's not always you know giant slam after giant slam it's not you know landslide after landslide but these teams just go to game five so often here and it's amazing that pre-workout power they haven't eked out a couple of victories they've just They've looked very, very solid here in game number four. I loved the way they played this Medivh comp. Yeah, I mean, game three so far was definitely the most even of any of the games that we've seen, but it feels like just late in game three, pre-workout power just flipped a switch 
and they gotta be riding quite the high coming into this game five whereas on the other hand we take it away if yeah you took those first two games but you lost the last two and at this point it is do or die for both teams an elimination game the final game of the series no matter what happens and just based purely off of momentum pre-workout Pala is looking stellar looking fantastic here taking a quick look at the stats Fisto obviously bringing heavy, heavy damage there for We Take It Away at nearly 75k. Top hero damage over on the side of pre-workout power was actually Maka on the Vala, a little under 40,000 there. The damage that they were able to put out was very much targeted in getting those kills before Anduin could get a ton of healing off. I mean, they just, they were able to stay on the points for long enough. It was great. Yeah, I mean, when you're not necessarily fighting for super long, you just show up, win the fight, get a couple picks, and then win the objective. You're not going to rack up super high heal or not going to rack up super high damage numbers, uh, but it is going to be very effective in securing those objectives. And I got to say, I just love watching D.Va still just be so useful, so well executed by a player like Nazmus. Very well done right there. Well, that is... We, I wasn't expecting a game five. I gotta be honest. Me was neither. not expecting no, I, a game five. I wasn't but expecting we are... a game four, Crash. <laughs> <laughs> but we are loading it up here, waiting to see who ended up choosing this map for our game number five. But this is, uh, man, this is going to be a real nail biter here as we try to load in our players. I want to see who chose the map. Very, very interested. Set that lobby mode. <laughs> Gots to see the lobby mode. Hope you're Game having a five. good time, chap. You're having a fantastic time out there. Oh, I mean, this has been a thriller of a series so far. It threatened to be a bit of a stomp early, but like I said at the end of that game too, it's anybody's game. At this point, it looks... Uh, we have a bit of a confusion about bringing in the players. Not quite sure what exactly is going on. Alrighty, but I think that might five... be just a friend who joined off the off the friend list. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you get a clinger in the lobbies. That's okay. Yeah. No, I, I've had times <laughs> where I just like hopped into a custom game to try something out. You know, to test something out for a YouTube video or whatever, and I get competitive players just joining on me, and they're like, "Oh wait, this isn't in houses." Oh, <laughs> and they just hop out. Uh, that's always funny when that happens. And here we see it looks like so far first draft, first pick going to Team One, indicating uh, that we have pre-workout power choosing Cursed Hollow for this last game. Mm -hmm. The teams are readying up, and I can't help but think. We're going to see the influence, uh, some some heroes right here that I think are going to show up back again. Maka on that Sylvanas is at mm. least going to be a threat. Sylvanas, this is a map, Cursed Hollow, where pushing with bosses is critical. And what hero pushes with bosses better than Sylv? That's certainly going to be on the table. Slug Hunter has already played Tahaka twice. I expect him to very strongly consider reprising that for this final game of the series. We got a lot of options here in game number five, but no matter what it is, I know it's going to be good. This is, uh, this is it. This is Cursed Hollow. Sky Temple, the only map left out of the pool here. They choose Cursed over Sky. We take it the way it will be first pick once again. And Cursed is a map that, kind of similar to the first two games, has the potential to end early. If you can get on a roll, you can get 2-0 on those Cursed points. You have a lot of options to run the map here. So I feel like picking a comp with some early game power is going to be important for these squads. You see the Anubarak, I believe, banned for the first time this series, and Maka Sylvanas is not going to be an option. It's leaving some bruisers up here, as I imagine Junkrat is removed. There it is. So Hogger's up, Blaze is up, Lunar is up, but there's that to Haka, Slug Hunter wants to go back to the winning ways of the earlier part of the series. Two for two, Jack. Did I call it or did I call it? Before we even got to second team's first pick, let's go. <laughs> Sylv and Dahaka taken away. I wouldn't be surprised to see Brightwing return for Weary Day as well, trying to get that global advantage here 
maybe even a Falstad, brings a high amount of boss control with that gust, as well as the global, and there's the hogger from Nazmus. Nazmus gonna try to run the camps, run the lanes on this hogger. Hanzo, CPX bring in that. There's a lot of great corridors for Hanzo to fight in, and of course the Dragon Arrow can come from out of vision so easily. Tremor going right back to the Muradin here. Mason Blaze gonna do a Grey Main for us. Some great camp potential and some great burst potential to possibly follow up these Tahaka engages. Yeah, just looking generally solid right there. Really good siege with the Grey Main. Muradin, just a great hero in general. Tahaka with the global. Uh, this could go into multiple different styles for We Take It The Way of not showing too much of their hand, and it just looks like we're just stacking up solid heroes at the moment with the first half of the draft, and we're going to get into more specific play styles as the second half post third ban starts to shake out. So if I'm weak taketh away at here, are you worried about some kind of cheese? Are you thinking Vikings? Are you thinking Abathur? Probably not with Hanzo. They're gonna just remove a solid pick in the Brightwing to try to control the global game. Do you feel like there's a Falstad Hanzo possibly coming out here, or is that too cheeky into a gray main? So what I think here is that you can't pick a Brightwing, and if you pick the Falstad, you are opening yourself up to a terrible possibility of having to go up against a Zeratul. And yeah. Zeratul able to just feast on that backline of Hanzo and Falstad, no Brightwing to save them. Still very much an option if you ask me into what we see right here. I would at least heavily consider it for the side of We Taketh Awayeth. You're able to go for whatever playstyle you want. You can dive that backline. You can go for the big VPQ. You can go for the split push with the auto attack Zeratul. You can bully that backline with the auto attack Zeratul. A lot of options available, but it may come down to specific comfort and practice at this point. We do see Lunara banned out in the first couple of games, and there's Mal Falstead on the side of We Taketh Awayeth. Big global advantage right here. No globals on the side of pre-workout power. Two for We Take It The Way of. Unless they go Hogger Tank Vikings. Nope, it's very. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, throw them a curveball. Right. Wait a minute. <laughs> We've been had. And very now. in the final pick, going together with that Stukov. Very much classic combination there. We Take It The Way of. They look like they're trying to run this map right now. Pretty similar to what they did on Battlefield of Eternity. Pre-workout power looking very confident in their ability to run in and find those quick picks. It's going to be a clash of styles once again here. And I will say one thing that is on my mind in regard to this is really just how are the fights over the boss pits going to look? You, of course, anytime you're talking about a false tower in Cursed Hollow, you're thinking about the gust pushing people off of that boss point to secure the captures but you're into a hogger who has a very long duration, effectively infinite duration, unstoppable, that allows him to stay near that point, override that gust, and play for that boss whenever he wants. This could go either way. I'll be honest, I'm not a huge fan of the Varian right here, uh, but it could exploit the Malfurion's weakness in dealing with the burst presence with the combo of the Varian Stukov, able to set up those single target damage kills. And I, I just don't even want to call this either way. <laughs> I, 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 I've i learned that anything can happen in this series. It's going to be it here, though. We're at game number five for the final time. We're going to present these teams. Five, on the left of the blue, it's four, We Take It The Way of Weary Day on Malfurion, Mason Blaze on the Grey Main, Tremors on Muradin, Slug Hunters on the Dahaka, and we've got Zergling on Falstad. Over there for the right side, our very last time of the series today, regardless of the result, pre-workout power, trotting out, CPX on that Hanzo, Nazmus taking it from Diva to Hogger this game, unaverted on the Varian, Maka Lunara, and Legacy on the Stukov. Let's see what the clash is like here. We take it away with pre-splitting top and bot, Falstad staying out of vision for now, just to be a possible threat in the mid lane, but does walk on forward. We see Varian already down there trying to deal with the Haka, unaverted, just doing what a good pre-4 pre Varian can, and just grabbing some of those minions. 
Oh, huge damage under CPX right there. Legacy oh, doing his best it. to peel in no. the mid lane. <laughs> I was watching CPX the hogger flank. <laughs> CPX got caught by an aggressive tremor. Stormbolt into an instant weary day entangling root follow up. And of course, Greymane able to just always instantly follow up with that burst damage. Oh. Mason Blaze taking an opportunity to get some siege damage here. Legacy going oh for a very goodness. expensive auto attack onto Mason Blaze. Going to take a lot of damage in the progress, in the process. However, camps are respawning at this point. Spawning for the first time, rather. Teams looking for that. Actually, no Siege Giant camp just yet for We Take It The Way If, and Bruiser's already getting advanced. Here's an invade very early in the game. It's going to be spotted here by the Wisp, by Hanzo. See if there's going to be a scuffle here. Okay. Falstad's flying right over the top. They're going to try to get this. Maka and CPX are poking in on the edge. Hogger very low, hits a very, you know, a very timely bounce away. Nazma's going to survive. CPX has the natural agility to jump away, but a nice invade. Good recognition oh, wait, there. there's Tremor on CPX and he has oh. no jump. He's going to get caught again. CPX second death in the first two minutes. What a catch there. Two kills for We Taketh Awayeth. Looking really, really good here. Playing that, you know, counter variant comp, which is we're before level four. We get to go do whatever we please, and they're doing a great job of it so far. Exactly. This is just expert recognition by We Take It The Way Of in so many different factors. They know, hey, we have two globals, pre-workout power has none. If we simply keep our globals in those side lanes and invade with the other three non-global heroes, we get that advantage even though the invade got spotted. There's no taunt on that variant, so he's effectively a melee minion, and we know we can bring everybody in for that invade. So that's why they didn't take their camps right there, and now this Siege Giants, with the timing, is going to be able to split push during this objective and that's going to feel especially bad for pre-workout power who do not have a global to be able to deal with this side pressure slightly head-on experience but it doesn't look like there's going to be a big difference in the path to level seven for both teams circling able to barrel roll out after getting taunted there in the mid tribute is spawning here on the bottom side we've got lunara trying to deal with the haka there in the top lane falstad covering the mid here we'll see if we take it the way it is just going to take it nice and slow and go for a delay but a nice taunt combo tremor able to jump on out just before the lurking arm landed and legacy has already shown to be very very deadly on the stukov so far in this series that's going to be one okay. to watch Let's just be honest, Legacy is just a deadly support player, okay? That guy knows what he's doing. As we see both globals coming in onto Unaverted, instant tongue from Slug Hunter, followed up by the Entangling Roots. The CC chains are there. Three kills to nothing for We Take It Away. Boss not going to come up just quite yet. And we do see a Quicksilver Bullets. I love it. Everybody's been picking the other Raymane Sevens, and I feel like I've been taking crazy pills because I feel like extra range is just insane. So I feel I validated by you right there. Yeah, it's, it's just, I'm an auto attacker at heart. You know, you know, Ooga Booga right click. <laughs> That's all I know how to do. Regardless, <laughs> we see Legacy defending bot lane, Falstad zergling now waltzing back up to that top side. And ooh, Nazmus actually tried to interrupt Slug Hunter's rotation onto mid. Slug Hunter dodged it with the burrow, and and then able to get the wall bang, actually able to get, uh, Slug Hunter able to get the tongue onto Nazmus, bringing him under tower shots for a moment right there. Well played in that little micro one on one. Tremor gonna take out that mid tower. Maybe. Oh no, Tremor. gets taunted Tremor. before the auto attack, has to jump out. CPX tries no. to get at the loot horde with the kill. Oh no, Murden thought that the auto attack was gonna be enough, but then went back in and got taunted. What a play by pre workout power. And that is very, very important to not go 2-0 on these curse points. Little bit of a blunder 25 there. 25 HP. 25 <laughs> yeah. HP on that middle tower right there. And that's the difference in finishing off Tremor or not. However, despite the loss of Tremor, we take it away if able to take a moment to get some chip damage onto this bottom fort, wisely retreating before too heavy of a rotation. There's the instant follow-up from Legacy, going to get CPX cleansed by Weary Day, lands the tongue on to Legacy. Legacy Whoa. taking so much damage will go down. Unaverted trying chase to chase continues. away here. Slug Hunter has the uh, dragon, is gonna bring him back in. Unaverted with nowhere to go is gonna, gonna be thinking fall. About boss. boss is up, they gotta be thinking about it after that double kill. Slug Hunter gonna catch the wave. Falstad still on the top side here. Looks like they're gonna choose to finish up the fort. The tribute is right next to them here. They're gonna have level 10s. 
They probably don't get the opportunity to get the fort, the curse point, and a boss, but we'll see what pre-workout power, what their rotation looks like here. We might simply get a boss trade, as Maka is actually going to start this up on the top right for pre-workout power. Slugrunner able to get some of that soak into the mid lane, and I gotta say, this is where that double global advantage is also going to continually show in the XP advantage for We Take It Away, of able to simultaneously pressure every single aspect of the map all at once. We will see this boss trade be completed very, very soon. Dahaka gonna go ahead and get that defense against top. And I don't think they're going to be able to get the free channel point in as we do see red side approaching CPX actually using his sonic arrow right away not going to have it available for the stall and the dragon arrow gets intercepted. Weary day self interrupted there thinking that they maybe needed to go in and get the heals off a nice interception on the dragon arrow by the rest of the team there. Weary Day is going to finish up this channel. Top side boss looks like it's going to be finishing off the fort. Bottom side boss pretty healthy as it moves into the keep wall. We take it the way if it's going to move up to clear this mid lane. And Nazma's an unaverted. Got to be careful here. The Slug Hunter is moving forward. The drag's going to connect, but a nice push off there by Nazma's. There we see CPX completing the simple geometry seven minutes into the game. Lunara getting dragged over to that bottom side, having to defend against the boss. I must point out the siphoning toxin. I tell people that talent is good all the time. Hopefully they'll believe me now, but I know they won't. As we <laughs> see here, we take it the way of on their bruiser camp on this left side. Slug Hunter warning, hey guys, I'm bringing a bit of a party with me here. They're taking a look at us. Nasmus is nearby. Pre-workout power not going to commit for the invade though. And it's we're so just hard going to, to invade them back against off. globals. It's not a full bright wing save, but Falstad coming on in with a yeah, giant, you know, gust Falstad. play over the top in the, that camp pit. Definitely not something pre workout Powell wants to deal with, so they don't go forward with the invade here. We're 2 1 on curse points here for We Taketh Awayeth, so we're likely to see a contest here from pre workout Powell as they get the counter siege camp alongside We Taketh Awayeth. Falstad is way up in the top lane, though, is actually too far away to fly in. So we're going to have to see Zergling probably clear this and make their way towards mid to be able to access this fight. Or just this trade out for Nahaka. This is just a difficult That's contest. A this is just such a difficult contest from pre-workout power, and you can see in that the fact that they're not even going oh, for wow, it. They're not it's on the it. side... Even though it was two out of three, you gotta think about it. They had a bruiser camp in mid, they had a siege camp on top with a Dahaka split pushing, they're down level 13, and it's mm. on We Take It Away side of the map. So taking the decision to just say, hey, we're just gonna give up this curse rather than lose the fight and then get cursed, uh, that would be even worse. Just cutting their losses a little bit. Nasmus and Slughunter duking it out. Slughunter does land a tongue onto Nasmus in the top lane. Nasmus responds in kind with the wall bang. Now just trying to clear out the giant. Dragon There's arrow. an arrow in the top though. And it's not going to lead to a kill. It's just going to be a little bit of poke damage onto Slug Hunter. Nasmus with the oh, three inch horde bolt before the tongue. Standing in the Siege Giants. Oh, uh -oh. where's that ISO going, though? ISO doesn't connect. Nasmus is starting to heal up from that trait. Drag doesn't connect there. And the ultimate battle finally disconnects here. We take it the way if they're putting some hurt down in the bottom lane. Oh, CPX taking a big hit there from the Hangmerang of Zergling. Curse only has about 10 more seconds left. There's the charge on Averted, gonna find a quick taunt onto Muradin, but the damage follow-up, oh, is actually really good. Nice <laughs> nice scatter arrow there. Zergling <laughs> is gonna push the rest away, and they're gonna turn around on the Averted. Varian is going to be caught. What a play from Zergling. You have to be careful as the main tank whenever you go in very aggressively on the enemy backline because one false dead gust is all it takes for you to just be completely separated from your team as we saw right there. And now we take it away with a single kill advantage onto the enemy main tank, getting some siege damage onto this bot keep. Tremor dropping very low, but as we mentioned before, Muradin's HP is a resource that he is willing to oh, trade freely. Arrow. Big arrow by CPX. Weary day in huge trouble, pops the tranquility. There's the double leaping strike, but Lunara is traded out. Slug hunt Hunter low in the back. Mason Blaze has to roll away here. Legacy moves in with the slow, but look at the movement speed. Mason Blaze. Oh, nice dodge on the lurking arm. CPX is on the chase, though. There's a nice dive onto the wall, and I think Mason Blaze might make it out. Oh. There's the scatter. Muradin coming on from the top side, and Mason Blaze escapes. CPX wanted that bad. Oh. Nasmus. Oh, I think it was interrupted Wait, with dude. the own trait there. Yeah, that loot hoard. I, I haven't seen that before. Wow, that's actually kind of wild. That was the pre-cog loot hoard. 
yeah, a little bit of a prediction right there from Nazmus. Maybe definitely saves himself from taking a lot of damage. Free workout power. Gonna want to take their bruiser camp right here. Their siege camp is going to respawn incredibly soon as well. Mason Blaze on his team's own siege camp. We're just gonna see a bit of waiting right now. In a bit of a transitory period at the moment, teams waiting to get 16, getting out these camps. Tremor with a bit of the aggressive scouting at the same time. Everyone just getting their camps done. Pre-workout power, gonna get the double camp. There is the siege camp taken. Bosses are coming up here. Pre-workout power in the area of their own. We take it away. It looks like they're doubling back to their own boss. So we're going in for another boss trade here. Bottom keep for pre-workout power though is pretty low. Yeah, the they're gonna have to be careful or that boss will just walk up and take the structure. The more damage that your structures take in the boss lane, the closer the enemy team is to having a win condition. And at this point, with that bottom keep being half HP, if even two members of pre-workout power get picked, that's a win condition as we see Nazmus using the Hortipult to escape on oh, the arrow. Not connected by Zergling, good reaction time, good awareness by Zergling to avoid that. And Mason Blaze clearing out the lane in preparation for this boss to advance. And with neither team being anywhere close to finishing off the trib, they are in fact going to go for it as we see Nazmus stepping up looking for the cap, but he's got company. Activates the unstoppable. Slug Hunter trying to hold on here, but is slowed out. Tremors over the top there. Gonna find a stun. Mason Blaze jumps in. There's the drag connection. Hogger is taken down. Zergling gonna grab another curse point here. I don't think the boss takes the keep in the bottom lane. It does not. It does Good not. defense there from pre-workout power to deny the constant catapults. Top lane boss will be smoten. Probably will not take a piece out of this keep. Uh, no, it slams down. It's probably going to take a couple of whacks there. It'll give it a couple of good meaty whacks onto that top keep. And now with not much to play for on the map, we take it away of simply finishing off their bruiser camp, saving it for later, looking to have it pressured during this next objective, which is just announced right now. And of course, that lone siege giant also chipping away at top, but it will go down in just a moment to minions. Oh. <laughs> there it goes. <laughs> as, as, <laughs> quoth a giant one time. Uh-oh. Please come back. Varian Banner used to scout the bush. Tremor barely able to avoid that lurking arm. Dragon Arrow does come out, only connects on a weary day. Not worthy of follow-up. Crushinator uh -oh, has left and I'm rejoins. I'm good, I'm good, I'm back. Alright. <laughs> Slug Hunter finds the drag on the top side. There's a great lurking arm placement. Gust is going to have to come out. Will it be enough to save Tremor? Pops the avatar and jumps back in to the healing area. Tremor going to stay alive there as the fight resets a little bit. Drag is going to come on out there. Slug Hunter is going to pull in Nazmus. Can they follow up on the damage? Right now, Tremor is kind of locked away on the top side. And now, keep in mind that as long as nothing happens, Bruiser is pressuring, taunt, however, taunt. there's a huge taunt! I oh spoke too God. soon, the double kill by pre-workout power onto the Haka and Malfurion, make it a triple! Add Muradin to it at the same time, huge engage, huge follow-up, Stukov's ability as a support to put that much kill pressure from across oh, the screen? Blizzard nerf, please. There's Falstead with the back door, will be able to finish off that keep, can back. he get the back? He's not gonna get it. He's not gonna get Portable's it. CPX is not there ready. too soon. Scatter misses. Oh, oh my god. Oh. The Stormbolt connects. Zergling is going to get chased down here. I can't believe the scatter dodged, but the Stormbow was ready to go. Nice find there. The keep is taken. Traded out for 50 seconds on Falstad. And that means Falstad's not gonna be up for this tribute, and pre workout power could get themselves a curse. Mason Blaze timing that siege camp, delaying the capture, as we've seen we take it away with do over and over again this series, trying to get it to push as late as possible during this objective. With so many members of We Take It Away with dying, though, definitely not able to contest this. This will be a curse for pre-workout power here, who would love to pick up their first keep of the game, or even just their second fort, honestly. Open up this map a little bit. Mason, Mason Blaze Blaze. Blaze looking at Nazmus in this top lane. Nazmus felt it coming. Still in the area here, but it looks like the rest of the crew is coming on up to help out as the curse is activated. Nice job by Slug Hanzo's Hunter bothering. avoiding the knockback. Hanzo has to pick play of the game here. I have to imagine at least if a fight were to break out, that upon hitting 20 he would pick it, but Hanzo's going to have enough time to rotate towards his team at this point. Curse is now activated. Hanzo is on the way play here. Play of the game is locked. 
Keep is going to start to take some pressure. We take it away. It's not even going to step in range. Just not going to give any kind of engage there. Top yeah, keep if you will get fall. Baited, if you get baited into defending this keep, all you're really doing is just fighting down level 20. And not only do they get this keep, they get the game. Wisely recognizing and having the discipline to say, hey, losing that keep is better than losing the entire game. We're going to give it. Now both teams having an exposed lane in their boss lanes at this point i think that we're not going to see boss trades as much as just maybe contesting but who knows right here both bosses eerily similar in their respawn timing i want to say only about two or three seconds off from each of the others teams posturing around theirs bruiser camp secured for pre-workout power are we gonna see a boss race to the core they're both just it's... setting up to take it the globals would seem to favor Pre workout power, they've got the minions already pushing onto the keep in the top lane. We take it the way it does not have the minion pressure in the bottom lane here. I'm not sure what you do here. Boss is claimed by pre workout power, they're not charging through the top lane just yet. We take it the way it grabs their own boss. Looks like pre workout power wants to find a flank here. Slug Hunter stepping forward starts the back, but here's actually the entirety of pre workout power jumping on him. Tunneling Claws oh, no. going to enable Slug Hunter to back up. Will get interrupted on the tongue by Dragon Arrow, and there is a wind tunnel isolating a bit. Hogger no controlling deep in the back line, but so oh, no. isolated, we'll get picked off. No control as nice job by Falstad isolating the rest of the team. It's only the one kill. Greymane had to break off to the top lane. Pre-workout power is gonna clear this boss. We take it away. Gonna might take a little bit of core HP here as Mason Blaze is locked on, is calling for help there. Pre-workout power, smite the boss. Falstad is on the way here. Catapults are being delayed by the body of Greymane for now. Looks like the core might take a smidgen of damage. One more auto. Yeah, just the 2%. Uh, GG. GG. GG has power. been called. The, the advantage is immense <laughs> <laughs> with the 2% core HP. And now here we see we take it away with getting uh, this bruiser camp. And I got to say, I thought that that would be a little bit more game deciding when I saw the hogger get yeah. dropped right there. Uh, I, I thought that we might see a little bit more pressure, but no, this game continues to extend just a little bit longer. Bruiser Camp can, now going to push mid. Yeah, I, I can see the, the thought process from We Take It Away. The if they go to the bottom lane right away, that's the play. Either they win or they lose. The boss is in the top lane is going to take their core. So they're saying, we think we can win the next fight by making this play. And now at this point, Mason Blaze contesting this. Pre-workout power way too far away to get this contest. They're just going to go ahead and let it happen. Down 2-0. Next trip could very well mean the loss of all keeps and some threatening onto the core of pre-workout power. We take it the way of backing away at the moment. Not looking for anything too spicy as they know their siege giants are pressuring Tremor? that top. Tremor gonna jump on out of there. Doesn't get, get over the wall, wall though. Oh no. Augur is gonna go in there. There's the swipes. There's the gust away. Everyone committing. Zergling gets out of trouble, but Hogger gets caught. There's the single swipe from Legacy. They're on the chase. Mason Blaze trying to get in range, but another swipe from Legacy. Slug Hunter is gonna dig on in and try to stop these backs. Taunt from Unaverted. Tremor moves up. Misses Legacy, but the damage is too high. Stukov is down. We take it the way if are going to continue on forward. Can they move into the core? At this point, Tremor jumping forward onto Unaverted. Wow, the charge onto Lunara from Unaverted. Barely saving him by the skin of his teeth, able to get out of there. CPX defending onto Falstad's the top. Going to the oh, objective. and Falstead flying away. The rest of We Take It The Way of going to stay in mid lane. They know that a curse is imminent. They're just going to get started with this siege pressure right away. With two members of pre-workout power dead, I honestly feel like they could have just walked past and started threatening the core. They see it a little bit differently. They're getting the siege pressure onto mid. Taunt goes out onto Tremor from the very end followed up by the entangling roots, followed up by the tongue. It's everything, but not quite able to get some damage onto Unaverted, oh and Hogger's coming up soon. Hogger's about to be back. There's some pressure in the mid lane, but there's no pressure in the bottom lane. We take it the way if they're going to start circling around the core, but Nasmus is here. Ten seconds on Stukov. There's a stun in the back. Play of the game comes on out. The taunt is in on a weary day. There goes Malfurion. Nasmus pushes away Falstad in the back as Trumper tries to move on out. Slug Hunter is going to be taken down. Pre-workout power has has defended off of two kills earlier by We Taketh Awayeth. 
And they still lose all of their keeps in the meantime. Oh my and goodness. as a team, as a team that has no globals, uh, that's going to be a significant amount of pressure. Uh, they're gravitating over towards the top side of the map they now. Can't Long the death minions. timers. The minions Ooh, are and that's heavy minion pressure in their base. And pre workout Pally has to be cognizant of this. Here's Falstead coming in, but he is getting flanked by Hogger and by Varian. Zergling has to Nasmus know Nazmus scouting him out. Fly! Oh, he canceled his own fly. He doesn't have Gust for another seven seconds. Hogger not quite able to catch up to him, though. There's the no control. Gonna keep Nazmus on top of Zergling. Zergling now has back. a Gust, but here's an averted. Oh. Has the fly. Oh. Unaverted, just a step behind there. Hogger pushed away, not able to activate the Hortipult to move in onto Falstad. And Zergling gets out of trouble. Oh my goodness. Absolutely massive plays, <laughs> and I want to say just a dash of throwing a little just, bit here just, in this game five. Oh just a pinch. Just, uh oh, <laughs> throwing invade, to taste here. as we see Lunara Wisp here <laughs> approaching onto Tremor. They've uh -oh. shown a willingness to pull the trigger onto Tremor. Slug Hunter as well is in range. There's there the horrible. There's the cop on Tremor. Oh wow. my goodness, Meriden is melted. That's a 60 second death timer and pre-workout power, they're on the boss. We take it the way of, are gonna have to make a gargantuan play here. They've got pressure in the top lane, the mid catapults are starting to build up. Can they just move past this boss? Falstad is not gonna be able to make a gust play here. There's the boss. Are they gonna have to go core race? No, no pre-workout power is doing a double boss play. They're going for the double boss. Bottom's too fortified. At this point, you gotta remember, bosses scale every minute. So when you're gonna have a 23 minute boss for pre-workout power, that is going to be so, so tough in representing the kill pressure onto this core of We Take It The Way That's certainly what's on the minds of pre-workout power. Both teams so far away from curse so as to make it irrelevant in the current state of the game. It's all about this top boss and what's going to happen with it. It's gonna be marching down the lane here, we see Cutting off the side here is Legacy and Unaverted. They're looking for that rotation. Right now, we take it the way of just trying to get the lane pressure elsewhere to make sure the minions don't collapse. There's an objective. I'm sure someone cares. Hanzo is thinking about it. CPX not even going to stop. Just coming on the way to help the team. Uh, it's, it's sticking around for now. The boss is on the way. Maybe going for a big arrow engage. Here it comes. Arrow's on the way. Arrow! It's going to hit onto two. It's going to be quickly cleansed, though. Big push away by Zergling, and we take it away. They're just trying to buy an opportunity to kill this boss. Getting big damage onto the boss right here, and now pre-workout power going in. Taunt onto Falstead. Blows him up instantly. We've seen this movie before. Oh, oh, Trevor getting the reset takes out Legacy right away. However, this core is dropping like a stone, and it's going to be pre-workout power. is down, but Mach is full Fishing health. The series. Lunara is on and pre-workout wow. power full reverse sweep are your storm division champions what how do you go crush <laughs> how do you get one kill in game one and one kill in game two and turn oh. it into that how does that happen <laughs> what mind blowing a conclusion just going all in with the jumps. Varian Hogger find the target. Legacy is ready with the lurking arms. And we take it the way it they were just on the edge so often. But pre-workout power with the fantastic surge in the late game. Find the victory. Let's get a post-match screen. And I'm going to see if we can find ourselves an interview. That's just... <laughs> I, I just... It blows my mind that that even happened. I gotta say, just the playmaking, the synergy, unaverted, recognizing, hey, everyone is a kill target with this composition. We don't care if you're a Muradin, we don't care if you're a Dahaka, I'm a Varian, I've got my Stuka following me up from across the screen with these silences. We've got the burst pressure, CPX hitting massive arrow after massive arrow in this series right there, defending the base, just so many clutch moments, back to back to back, it was, Ah, I just oh could never gosh. tell who was going to take it start to finish. I thought this was going to be a quick series. After game two, I was like, oh, hey, I'm going to hang out with my wife a little bit before she goes to bed. No. All right, going <laughs> full five games down to the wire. Absolutely. Oh what an insane finish.
What a finish indeed. Looks like we're going to have an interview here. Can you want to meet me down in Lobby 2 there in the NGS Discord? I'll see you there. All right, we're on the way. All righty. We're going to wait for CPX to join after a crazy, crazy series. And there we go. CPX, Yo. welcome. Congratulations on? on a tremendous reverse sweep. Oh, thanks. That was wild. <laughs> that was something else. Oh, what I thought series. for sure we were about to get 40 would for the 3 0 <laughs> Like, that, that, I mean, that was, I was, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, and that was wild. And then I started off the last game of the series, too, just like the other ones, just inting my, out of my mind at level one and then level three. Uh, I, but yeah, who pulled it off? Great teamwork. Teamwork makes dream work. Just wow, what an incredible series. Let's let's start with game number three. We take it the way it was coming out the gates strong, absolutely controlling the map there. Is that something that you felt was going to happen regardless with that Abathur comp? Just a little bit of weakness in the early game? No, I mean we we knew that we scaled, but we were definitely not planning on that happening like it i nobody said it but like we i'm sure everyone was thinking like this is not good <laughs> <laughs> you know like we we're down 2-0 and then they then they get triple cap on the first one then we finally look like we're gonna get a cap for the, on the next phase and then we all die still and like you know but we pulled it out you know man just it was it was so nail biting from that point on it was yeah like you said it was looking like oh my goodness wta ate their wheaties today and you, you take game three on Towers of Doom in very, very exciting fashion with the six cap, with the final shots. Infernal Shrines, it looked like the momentum was really, you know, you guys had really picked it up. It looked like the pre-workout had really kicked in there. Tell me about the mood there going through game four. I mean, I definitely took some more pre-workout after game three, <laughs> but um, uh, I don't know. Uh, I think, uh, I know we just, I mean, we're, we, you know, like, we're pretty level headed. Like we're obviously like disappointed when like things aren't going well, but you know, we're not, we're not like tilters. So I think we just went into the next game and then we got a great draft. We were all really happy. Naz had said after we lost game one, if this is, if we go to two, one, like maybe diva. And then he held last pick and got the diva. I got Medivh, Diablo Medivh. I think we just all had a great time. Good drafts. And yeah, Onivert and uh, legacy might've joined too. I don't know. Legacy, you have any thoughts? Yeah. I wanted to talk to legacy actually specifically here. Perfect. Uh, Legacy, I thought you were kind of getting ganged up on a bit in those first two games, and that that takes some some fortitude to definitely go through that. It, it felt like I, I was seeing them just pressure you hard, game one, game two. Y'all get two kills in the first two games, I believe. What what are the comms like? What's the environment at the end of game two, at your lowest in this series? How do you come back from that? What what was going through your minds? What was being said in the comms? Uh I'm pretty sure I threatened uh, CPX with a Lunara game if he didn't stop venting. <laughs> they banned it, though. They banned it. <laughs> so uh, I think that was uh, where mine was at. But no, nah, uh, I mean, they played well. Uh, I think in game three, like, we realized, like, their whole comp is basically just to, like, jump on me. And it's, like, it's really hard for Stukov to live when there's a Yurel and a Dahaka diving on top of him. So there's the Medivh. You can shove one. Um but you can't really like shove both. Uh, that was the, the towers game. I see. I see. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's just there's so much action. Forgive me if I miss out <laughs> yeah. the timeline. Oh yeah, try, yeah. Here. I'm on the same boat. There's a lot to uh, soak in. Speaking yeah, of I, the uh, the Stukov, there's a lot of uh, a lot of naysaying, a lot of down talk to Stukov right now due to that lack of cleanse that's so heavily valued. Where do you feel like Stukov fits in the <laughs> healer hierarchy right now? Uh, he's definitely still really strong, um, but I think he's like a notch below the Lucios and Bright Wings of the world. But yeah. uh, I think he's definitely still a really strong pick. Uh, biggest thing is you typically will see it like paired with like a Falling Sword Johanna or like a Lunara, so you have that like pseudo cleanse to, to help make, make up for it. Makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah, because I saw that Sticky Bomb getting big value for the vast majority of Game 3, even Muradin uh, bringing it back into the team at one point into that bot lane, but still able to just turn that around. I gotta know, 
at, at what point? Can you give me a specific point in this series where you guys were just like, we got it, you know, like, like this is our series. We, we got it in the bag. When yeah. when did that turn happen? Let me go on this one. All right. So th- th- we when we didn't you know, how we didn't kill mid four on game three. On okay. purpose, like that was on purpose. Yeah. We, yeah. It was yeah, like the know, legacy we, we strat. It was that. We yeah. That. When yeah. the minion wave left that thing at one auto attack from death, it was over. That's when the series. It was over. <laughs> that was. So you you're know. telling me you're telling me down two zero <laughs> in game three, down twenty core health is when the series was over. In uh, uh, yep. Nope. But that's the joke I'll make. Uh, <laughs> no, nah, I think I think I think after um, we won game three, I think it was sort of like the weight like was like lifted off our shoulders in the sense that like like winnable because we didn't just come back because like if you look at like the series in the game and the si- we came back from like down 2-0 like then in that next game we were down so much it looked unwinnable kind of like the series might when you're down 2-0 and i feel like we just kind of you know powered through oh yeah um you were down for the first 2.9 games yeah and, so- and- Body to go from that to reverse sweep is just absolutely insane. And even in that game five, honestly, if yeah. you asked me to bet in that late game when when we saw the enemy team take that curse and they were in your base and you had two members dead, I would have bet everything on them taking that game right there. But you hit the big arrow, you come back. That just that surprised me i'm sure you guys had to even be surprised a bit i know you believed but weren't you at least a little bit surprised you pulled that out i mean pog arrow incoming you know <laughs> i mean that's like my favorite thing to say and that's my favorite map to do it on uh you know i think um you know obviously like my, we made a lot of big plays but i think uh like for me like when i have once i have level 20 arrow like i just you know i sort of feel like the game's under my control a little bit and um we did a really good job of like not panicking and um just like yoloing the fight in mid like i know personally i was thinking about like just yoloing the fight in mid like oh we got to win but then i you know i i you know i turned my brain on and i just watched my teammates die while i mounted back to core and then just defended, just yeah. to un- just to make sure i'm understanding you correctly cpx you're telling me you turned your brain on in game 5 of the finals no no no, no i'm saying i <laughs> yeah, don't, 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 yes i did turn it on it goes in and out it goes in and out it goes in and out it it, it, it was okay. off in the beginning of that one but uh yeah no i just uh cuz i meant more along the lines of i i was i was questioning making a very bad decision and i instead made the correct one was good i understand yeah i'm just teasing yeah, you a bit. Yeah. very well executed oh. here tonight well done exciting reverse sweep great job thank absolutely. you thanks for casting absolutely. they also gave cpx is medieve which uh is yeah. a no-no that's you know that that medieve game four i remember we were talking about it just like diablo vala this is feeling very medieve and then it came well, on down well, when they didn't ban medieve i was i was shocked i was i mean i was ecstatic i thought for sure they'd ban it like everyone knows like it's like like i was yeah and we had shown and it showed like you vala diablo like what you know it was so perfect yeah really wow i mean great display pre workout power with the three two champions for this round of storm division Tell me about this the the experience of this this phase as a whole. How did you feel about you know the the teams, the week to week matches, the sort of power level of the league in general? Did you feel? Did you have a good time here in season four? Actually, I had a wild ride because th- most of this roster we tried to qualify for it with on the last week. We we got knocked out of the qualifier by Diamond Hand. So then I joined not fans. And was like, yo, like, do you guys want to change the name to pre-workout power? Like, what is a not fan? And they were like, yeah. Then we got farmed by like CCS or something. I think it was CCS. And like half my team quit playing. So then I then I had to like I brought in all the all the people I had originally wanted to play with. Basically, I the entire team died at week three, and I had to bring in a whole new team. And then you know we scaled through the season. Like uh, ended up knocking out Diamond Hands in the playoffs. Like who had, actually had stopped basically get, gate kept us from getting an NGS division in the first place um but yeah i think sorry back to more around to your original point though um i mean i love ngs i think the games are so much fun um i think we had a lot of fun this series i think it's great to play with and against newer people um that you wouldn't normally get the chance to like with ccl and everything um and yeah uh i don't know legacy thoughts yeah i mean it was a it was a bat blast playing uh, i think uh, as far as like i think you said like power level like it felt very much like a split division like the top half like was very competitive with each other and the bottom half was competitive with each other but it seemed like 
Uh, they were just kind of split on that. So mm-hmm. hopefully, like, the teams just keep playing and improving. I think that was, like, a common theme with, like, I think the season before was also similar to that. But uh, I think it was closer than last season, this season. So that's always good to see. Well, I hope oh, by the way, Legacy, there. back-to-back. Yeah. Back to back champion, I just realized, just like CCL, kid you can't not lose. Or kid can't lose. <laughs> kid can't not win. Hey, I was saying it right at the start of the series today. I was like, I see some veterans of the game in here. Yes, I I know all of you. I've seen all of you in these latter games. Um, I've played against you guys in in-houses back when I was in those, and you guys were in HGC Open, like with Legacy, Nasmus, and HGC back in mm-hmm. the day, and I, I just see the composure, I see the experience, I see the skill, all just 100% evident Legacy for sure. Dude, I was hyping you up the whole series, and you absolutely came through. Thank you, I appreciate that. It was an absolute yeah. banger today. Total banger. Love to see it. We've been there before, I think, is kind of what I was thinking when, you know, like, sort of, I think a lot of newer players or less experienced players might, you know, look at the situations we were in today and, 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 you know, and sort of not play optimally. And I think with a lot of our experience, like, led us to being able to, you know, we've been there before. Like, I think our entire, everyone on our team has been in situations exactly like we were in, where it's like, looks unwinnable and you pull it out. And I think that helps a lot. It showed. It absolutely showed. Because you're right. There's a, that's a hallmark of experience is being in those. You know, it looks impossible, but you just get to keep a level head and say, from this moment, what do I need to do to win and execute on that? And that was that was, I think, the story of the day today. Yeah. Brilliant composure for sure. Well, reworkout power, an amazing reverse sweep for the grand finals today. And a great cap to the season. The floor is yours. Any final shout outs you'd like to make before we close this out? Lexi, you want to go first? Sure. Uh, shout out to you guys for casting and also just putting on the league. I know I mentioned it before, but you know, I've played in this a lot. Like NGS is awesome. It uh you know allows us to keep playing competitive and uh, you know, whether it's during CCL off season or just a good showcase for people that aren't in CCL yet kind of giving them you know i think this is like the best way for people that are hopefuls to just be able to show their stuff over the course of the season so uh love that you guys put it on it's always a a great time in the league so appreciate you guys doing that and then uh shout out to the team um i mean reverse sweeps aren't easy you gotta have a lot of composure for that so shout out to them and uh yeah i think that's it Uh, i'd say uh i'd Times two, everything Legacy, Legacy just said. I could not, never articulate it that well, so I'm just going to add the times two onto it and uh, say uh, Pog Arrow incoming. Twitch.tv slash TPogX1. <laughs> Boom. Fantastic. Mic drop. Once again, congratulations on your victory, Champion Season 4. We hope to see you again for the next one. Good luck going forward in CCL and good luck going forward in just Heroes of the Storm in general. It's great to have you out. Awesome. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Mockery, I'll call you back in just a moment. Sounds good. All righty. Let's get this call up. Mockery.